on the surface, it is just a Star Trek show that is in, as excited and is in love with Star Trek as I am. Tarek Profiles Podcast, Episode 87, recorded October 2023. This is the Trek Profiles Podcast, where each episode we talk with a Trekkie, we explore their fandom story, and we try to figure out why this show matters to us all so much. I'm John, your intrepid host of this whole enterprise, and I welcome you to this, the Trek Profiles Podcast, episode 87. If you wish to get in touch with us, you can reach us at feedback at trekprofiles.com, or Facebook, or Twitter, or Blue Sky, all at Trek Profiles. Here is your spoiler warning. This podcast may discuss any episode of Star Trek during the show. You have been warned, humans. As always, my trusty sidekick and co-host is the bold yet boyish, beleaguered, not boorish, and once in a blue moon bohemian M5 Multitronic Unit. Greet everyone, M5. The M5 stands by. Let's do some announcements. Announcements on screen. This is an independent show. If you'd like to support us, the best way to do that is just to follow us wherever you are getting your audio. We are on all the major platforms, and your following us helps other Trek fans find us. We bring you the show, and it's 100% free. And if you'd like to show some appreciation, I'd ask for your donation to our official charity here on the show. That's the Children's Fund for Glycogen Storage Disease. There's a link at trekprofiles.com donate to give directly to the charity if you'd like to participate. There are some lightly edited outtakes and bonus material at the end of this episode. They'll come after the ending audio cards. Now, just as an FYI, we talk a bit in the bonus material about the Apple TV show Severance, which I enjoyed and do recommend, but the bonus material contains extensive spoilers for the entire first season. So if you've not seen that show, I suggest skipping that part. So enjoy it or not as you choose. At the end of every episode, my guest faces my Kobayashi Maru lightning round. They get five terrible multiple choice Star Trek questions and they must give us their answer. And after each episode drops, I tweet those questions out as polls where you can have your say. So let's look at the questions from episode 85 with Derek McDuff and see how it went. Best Captain Shaw quote from these choices. One, I'm just a dipshit from Chicago. Two, good call. Or three, no. My guest picked Chicago, but in the online poll, it was neck and neck between Chicago and no, right up until the final votes. Chicago won at 47%. No, noped out at 46%, and good call was a bad call, getting only 7% in the final tally. Best Brig Escape, Jack Crusher, Michael Burnham, or Roga Danar. Roga Danar was the selection of both my guest and the poll people, escaping to a 41% margin. Burnham's computer-confusing escape earned a 34%, and Jack Crusher came in third with a respectable 25%. Pick one of these to be your Kobayashi Maru first officer, Spock, Riker, or Major Kira. Now, this one generated a lot of discussion on the Twitter machine, and people seemed to want to nominate their own answers, but that is not how the lightning round works. You got to pick from the choices I give you. My guest picked Spock, and he also edged out the competition in the poll, but it was a very tight race. Spock got 35, Major Kira got 33, and Riker got 32. And I'd like to highlight one response to the poll I got from an Andrew Coleman Francis on Twitter who said, quote, I instinctively went with Spock, but in retrospect, he was absolutely no help to Savick at all during her Kobayashi Maru, close quote. And I think that pretty much sums up my opinion on the matter as well. Best bridge ejection scene, Picard to Worf, Riker to Picard, or Kirk to Bailey. Both my guest and the Twitter people preferred the Picard one. The poll was 58% for that one, Kirk to Bailey was 25, and Riker to Picard was only at 17 which of these was the most annoying, the Bomar, the Aldeans, or the Malon? Now, for those who don't remember, the Bomar were from Voyager, and they were the ones in the episode The Raven, and they made Voyager jump through all those hoops uh, to permit them to jump through Bomar space or travel through Bomar space. The Aldeans were from TNG, and they kidnapped a bunch of kids from the Enterprise so that they could repopulate their planet. And of course, the Malon were the major space polluters in the Delta Quadrant, appearing in several Voyager episodes. My guest and the poll respondents picked the Malon. They got 62% in the poll, with the Bomar getting 24 and the Aldeans, who kidnapped a bunch of kids, only for 14. Sometimes the polls are wild, y'all. Now, if you enjoyed these questions and would like to take a stab at writing your own for possible inclusion in the show, you can send them to me, feedback at trekprofiles.com or DM me on Twitter or Blue Sky. 
And in fact, some of the questions in this very episode were written by listener and previous guest on this podcast, Peter Wolchak. We thank Peter for his contributions. All right, I got one thing in the mailbag for you. Frequent email correspondent Sandy sent me an email asking if I'm planning on doing anything special for episode 100. Now, given the long production time for my show, um, that may not actually be too far off in the future. And the answer is I haven't given it a single thought. So should I do something? What should I do? I don't know. Um, email me if you have thoughts, feedback at truckprofiles.com. Maybe I will. We'll see. All right, that's it for announcements and news. Let's get to it. M5, roll it. Commencing show transmission. Her favorite characters are Tendi and Jadzio at seven, a close runner up, but she also loves Garrick, that plain and not so simple tailor. But her favorite ship is not from any of those shows. No, 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 no. It's the ship that brings the faith of the heart. It's the NX01. She is from Los Angeles, California, North America, Earth, and Sector 001. It's Jesse Earl. Welcome, Jesse, and thanks for being on the podcast. Hi. Wow. I love that. That was a very energetic intro. That was great. I love it. We are high energy up in here. On yeah. Trek Profiles. That is that is just what we do. Um, that's just all part of the thing, you know, as we celebrate different kinds of Star Trek fans and why they love this show. Yeah. So are you ready to begin our interrogatories? I am most ready to boldly go. All right. Then we will start with question one, which is, are you a Star Trek fan? Yes. So the M5 tells me that you have been a Star Trek fan since you were nine years old. Is this in fact true? That is in fact true. Yeah. And how can you remember what, what happened when you were nine? That you said, man, this is for me. This Star Trek thing, I'm I'm all about it. Well, this will get into like our a little bit of our the shows and things that we talk about. But for the reason uh, that I fell in love with Star Trek is my parents are divorced, mm -hmm. so I would go to my dad's house on the weekends, my mom's house on the week, my mom's house on the weekdays, and there was like an hour long drive between their houses, so that we'd like kind of meet in the middle or whatever. There'd be a bookstore we stop at, um, and I buy way too many books probably also why i fell in love with books but my dad would always uh have like weird eclectic things that he'd listen to mm -hmm. um on the drive home and one weekend it was right around the time and this is why i know how old i was it was right when star trek nemesis came out so my dad had gotten the audiobook of star trek nemesis mm -hmm. and he just started playing it and back in those days they still do it for star wars but they don't really do it as much for star trek which is kind of disappointing but back in those days the um these Star Trek audiobooks were like a high production. They like had sci-fi sounds, music. It was it was a whole thing. And I, I just fell in love with listening to that audiobook. So I stole his uh he had the CDs. So I stole his CDs from because it was from the library. Oh, so we're making um, we're confessing so I, the crimes here at the on the Trek Profiles yes, podcast. Yes, I still I still think I I have them somewhere. <laughs> so oh dear. I, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, oh god, I could tell you there's some there's some other Star Trek uh library related crimes I could commit uh, I could uh, tell you about later on. But yeah, no, I, I took those library CDs and just listened to them over and over again. I think I still have them. And then from there, uh, because I fell in love with, my Star Trek, uh, with Star Trek with those CDs, my dad was a huge Trekkie as well, growing up, a big fan of Next Generation specifically. Mm -hmm. And so he started introducing me to Next Generation. He got me season seven on DVD, so the final season of TNG, which, because that was the most recent one that had just come out on sure. DVD. And, and that starts with Descent Part 2. Yes, it does. <laughs> which... Yeah, which is, I always, this is, it's just a very backwards way to do it because Next Generation is fairly episodic. You could pretty much start anywhere, except for, I think the worst possible episode is Descent Part 2, because that one has Data, it has Lore, it has the Borg, it has Hugh. It's like, it's like, it's a part two of, <laughs> I, I think, of anything. So I wonder if like Family would be the worst episode to start with. Best of Both Worlds Part 3. Um, like, does that episode yeah. land if you didn't even see the previous two? Yeah, I feel like, I feel like that. I feel like it doesn't land as hard, but because it's so emotional and like it's a very character driven story, you can at least get drawn into Picard. Mm. And but with like the Descent Part 2 and maybe maybe the fact that there was so much going on, is, it's kind of like the Lower Decks, like people are saying about Lower Decks nowadays. Like I love Lower Decks, even if I haven't seen Star Trek because I get see there's a bunch of references. But uh, but Descent's like you it just have to know, no pun intended, a lot of lore to get into this end part two. So I'm just like, I don't know who these Borg are. I don't know who Data is, let alone his brother. Uh, so it was, but I was fascinated by it. So I just, I watched all of season seven of TNG. Then Star Trek Enterprise was the show that was on week to week. And I got into that show week to week. And so, yeah, from there, it just took off. And so then you started watching everything after that in original broadcast. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I uh, got it. So to watch Star Trek Enterprise all the way until it was canceled. I started watching in season three of Enterprise where, where it gets good, as people will say, and then went all the way through the end of that. And then I caught like Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. They aired on um, Spike TV, the Manly Man's channel, as they advertised it, which clearly didn't work for me. Um, <laughs> as I always like to joke. Uh, but I watched those two shows on like I would DVR every episode and watch those on reruns. The original series is a little bit harder to catch uh, as I was growing up, but I did catch episodes here and there. Um, and then eventually those came out in DVD and i watched all those uh voyager 2 like they only aired it where i was living as reruns at midnight so i'd stay up till midnight just to catch episodes of voyager oh my goodness. with my mom yeah my mom would stay up and watch it with me she'd fall asleep halfway through the episodes but she'd stay up with me and yeah and then i and then the other big thing that i will we'll talk about too is i became a huge star trek book fan because i was a huge nerd loved books and honestly the only kind of new star trek coming out after enterprise was canceled for a certain amount of time was the novels and so i just fell in love with the star trek books yeah we had that whole period from 2004 to 2009 where you know that, that's all there was there's and there's sort of been a dearth of star trek books recently i mean it's not like it was you know there was a massive yeah. number you know um yeah you had been watching Star Trek and original broadcast. You picked up Enterprise in season three. I'm going to leave unremarked your comment that that's where it gets <laughs> I, good. Uh, I have I many will, things I to say about that. I will agree there are some great <laughs> things in seasons one and two. I, I really do. But uh, let's put it this way. Season three and four is where they make more interesting choices. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll put it that way. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then, of course, we had uh, the streaming era, the Kelvin movies, all of that. Did you watch all of that as it came out and subscribe to <laughs> CBS All Access, later Paramount oh, yeah. Plus, I and all of those things? I, I saw Star Trek 2009 in theaters. I dragged some of my friends to the theater with me who'd never seen any Star Trek, so I did that. Uh, saw Into Darkness in theater while I was in college. Uh, saw Beyond with a group of D&D friends on a Saturday when it came out. I remember where I worked at the time, there was like a big Beyond poster that I saw every day as I would like have to, like during my lunch break, I would walk by it and I was just like, oh, I love this. This is great. And then, yeah, Discovery, as soon as it came out, I was literally the night that it came out on CBL Access, I was literally refreshing the page to see what it came out. So yeah, I watched every single one. So Okay, so as we sit here, you've seen all the Star Trek that there is to see. Pretty, yeah. If it's if it, any live action or animated Star Trek, I have seen all of it and pretty much I've read a decent chunk of all the novels and comics as well. So, Oh, that's glorious. And there's a lot of books. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, sometimes I interview people on the show and they're like, yeah, I'm starting to get into Star Trek novels. And I'm like, good luck, buddy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is, we were, you were saying before we were recording, if you want to talk about collection stuff, but that's my collection. Uh, I am currently, I have a list of trying to collect every single Star Trek book and uh, novel. And I will say I'm about, uh, sorry, novel, uh, book and comic book. And I am about, I'm about like, 70 to 80 percent of of the comics and 70 to 80 percent of the novels like i have now, three whole bookshelves of them you're, you're not doing like the alternate covers and all that stuff are you oh god no god no that would that that would be a truly magnificent undertaking but no i just want to get <laughs> kind of what you were talking about with like uh preservation i want to like literally get one copy of every single one um so that it's like a li library of star trek so that it does exist everywhere so so are you reading these novels in dead tree format or are you just like collecting them and then getting the Kindle or what are you, what are you doing? I try to listen to the audiobook version if they have an audiobook available because I like the audiobooks a lot because that's how I got into Star Trek and I've always been an audiobook fan. In fact, that's my dream job is to do audio dramas for Star Trek. But uh, but no, if they don't have an audio drama, I try and read them. I don't I try. I read like one or two a year. So I'm not I probably won't ever read every single one of them. But I read every single comic book that's come out. So I've read pretty much every comic book that there is outside of a few that I'm missing from my Eagle Moss collection. That that's a whole other story. And then uh, I've read a decent chunk of the novels, not all of them, but a decent chunk of them. So you have this massive collection of all the books and comics that are currently in your possession. What percentage of them do you think you've read? Do you have a number of, on that? Uh, of what you have? Of what I have? Probably like 30, 40, 30 to 40% somewhere in that range. Definitely not half, but like 30 to 40% of them. Oh, wow. So you got a long road ahead of you. Oh, it's definitely got a long road, but you know, I, I'll have faith of the heart that I'll get through. <laughs> no, thank you. For, yeah, thank no. you for picking that up. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, I do have, I haven't read all of them. I just, honestly, I, I used to devour them when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, but now I just haven't had time as I'm older. So I'm just collecting them. And then hopefully one day when I get to retirement or something, I'll, I'll get through them all. But I do read, I do read every single one that comes out currently like if there's a new one that comes out like day and day i'll like read the audio book or listen to the audiobook or read the book so 
One thing I want to ask you about, which is maybe a topic that we haven't talked about on the show before, is I know that you have access to the screeners because you're, you know, nerd media, right? And mm-hmm. so Star Trek mm-hmm. allows people to, to get screeners. I don't have screener access. One of the things I'm interested in is because you get access to the shows early and you have to watch them on, like, you know, not all the platforms are supported. The screeners are kind of delivered in a special way for security, mm-hmm. which I get. How does watching those episodes as screeners affect your enjoyment of Star Trek just as a piece of pop entertainment? Yeah, that's a good question. It depends, because sometimes what I'll try and do, and don't tell CBS this, but uh, I'll bring a friend and watch it with a friend, which then I kind of enjoy, like, then I just enjoy it. And the way I typically watch screeners is I watch it once by myself or with a friend that's just pure enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't have to worry about it. And then the second time I'll do it for analysis and record for review and all that jazz. But the way it kind of would ruin my enjoyment or change my enjoyment, I guess would be the better way, is that I kind of binge a bunch of them because the way they send it out now is they usually will give you a big, big chunk of them at once. Okay. So like for Lower Decks, they sent me the first eight episodes of the season. So pretty much the entirety of the season minus the last two. So I've watched all of Lower Decks in a chunk instead of waiting week to week. The same thing with like Strange New World Season 1. I got the first five episodes all together. Card season three, I got the, like six episodes all together. So like, I think the biggest thing is like, I kind of get the binge version of Star Trek, mm-hmm. which I don't like as much. I kind of enjoy the week to week, but just, you know, given that like, I'm, you know, part of my job is reviewing them all. I do like just sort of watch them all in a binge so that I can sort of get a chance to record them in advance. So I have more free time. Do you find that the inability to to go wide and have discussions with other fans is sort of something that you're missing? Um... Yes and no. I mean, I kind of get it anyways in my comment section after every episode, and I kind of enjoy that part of it. In fact, it's kind of like more discussion than I get than I used to ever get. Because when I was a kid watching Star Trek, like watching Enterprise or whatever, I never really had uh, a ton of people to talk to other than people on the internet in like old Mm -hmm. forums and stuff at the same time. So honestly, the comment section kind of replicates that experience of me being a kid watching Star Trek. So that actually feels very familiar. What's what's stranger to me is actually having people in person to talk about Star Trek with. Um, So like when I go to convention, like I remember we at uh, Star Trek Las Vegas this year, that was like the the weekend that uh, I believe that was the weekend the finale of Strange New Worlds came out or close to something along that. So I had like other people that we were like watching and talking about that together with. And so we were sort of like it was like it was a weird experience to like actually be in a room talking with people about it. And it honestly still feels that way. Like, I remember watching the premiere of Discovery Season 1, and I brought over friends who had, like, seen a little bit of Star Trek, but never seen it. And so I was, like, trying to explain to them. It was like, so she's Spock's sister, I guess. And then, like, the Klingons at this time. Like, I was just trying to go through and explain it all. Like, that, that is actually a weirder experience for me than, like, talking about Star Trek online, which just seems part and parcel with the experience to me. So we've talked about collections, and you'd mentioned uh, conventions. So tell me about the first convention you ever went to. Oh, Star wow. Trek or sci-fi in general? So sci-fi in general, the first one would have been San Diego Comic-Con, I want to say 2009. Okay. I think that was it. Uh, whatever the last year that Lost was was on. And the reason I remember that is because I was a huge Lost nerd. Okay. That was like the big thing with Lost people. Like every year they'd have the Hall H experience with Lost and they like reveal stuff and it always seemed like a big deal. And it was like, I was such a big Lost fan. It's like, I need to be at the hall h for lost i would i I, like this is gonna be the last time they're ever gonna do it i need to be there and so my dad got a um uh did a family trip Mm -hmm. that was basically justified off of like we'll go to comic-con um (laughs) but uh and it was just him and me that would go but my my sister my brother and my stepmom also came and that we went around like san diego and los angeles at that time kind of stayed in the middle which ironically is where I, uh, without spoiling exactly where I live, but I kind of live in between those places too. So I actually kind of live there now. Uh, but we took a trip around there. We, they, we were doing that. But then one day I was just like, all right, it's the whole H day. So I got up at like five in the morning mm-hmm. and got on a train, went down to San Diego. It was like one of the first times I was like by myself um in a big city so went on a train into san diego got in line for hall h and i just sat there and, and got into the hall h experience my dad came later but i got into <laughs> hall h and it was it was a lot of fun i i still have vivid memories of being in hall h for that lost panel did he get into hall h with you oh god no he didn't even want to get up he didn't he didn't watch lost he didn't care that was why i had to go by myself he's like i'll come later we'll meet up later like i'll find you at the con which is also a bad idea because uh, it was hard to find him. Um, but like we were also at the con. Uh, he just came later. And I saw the Hall H stuff with me by myself. But what was fun, I, I can also share a couple other stories of that con too that are, are fun and, and burn into my memory. Can, uh, can yeah. I ask you one thing about Lost yeah. first? 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, were, were you satisfied with the ending? I actually was. I am one of the few weirdos that likes that ending. To be fair, I haven't gone back and rewatched. I need to do a lost rewatch at some point in the next few years. That and Battlestar Galactica. But I Mm -hmm. actually remember really liking Lost because I felt for me, while I did love the mysteries a lot, like I think the mysteries are really interesting and and I will be very fair. Yes, the the mystery, the answers to the mysteries at the end of that show are lackluster (laughs) and they they are (laughs) definitely are. But... I I kind of really bought into the the characters and the themes that that show was delving into. And a lot of that show dealt into like themes of science versus religion and, and mm-hmm. belief versus, you know, uh, versus science and things like that. And and I feel like that ending, while not good in terms of the actual plot necessarily, I thought it actually fit the characters and the themes really well and felt like a really natural conclusion to those ideas in kind of a kind of a beautiful way. Again, I probably would go back today and like look at it with a critical eye and be like, okay, there's some there's some nonsense happening here, even thematically. Uh, but I remember as a kid, I actually really, really liked that ending. But I understood okay. people's I understood people's vitriol, but for me, it worked. So okay, I I just wanted to ask since since you brought it up, you know, I, I know that it's definitely polarizing. I'm more on the I turned it off in disgust and have no interest to ever go back. Uh, I, I was in that camp. But, uh, uh, you know, people can take what they want from it and enjoy it if yeah. they like. So so you were saying you have some more memories of, of uh, 2009 Con. San Diego Comic-Con. So tell me what's going on with San Diego, San Diego Comic-Con. What else happened besides the wonderful Lost Hall H experience? <laughs> yeah. The two stories that I remember, one is kind of uh, one is just funny because I've told them this sense. And the other one, um, the other one is just embarrassing. So I'll tell the embarrassing one first is I told you that my dad was going to meet me later on. And so I had like an old flip phone. At that time, it was mm-hmm. before the time of iPhones. And so uh, there was a panel with J. Michael's, J. Michael Straczynski, who uh, many people know is writing Babylon 5 and a bunch of other things. Uh, Sense8, he was part of as well. It's another one of my favorite shows. Um, so I was a big fan of him uh, for Babylon 5 at that time. So I went to the panel and they have the panels. You can go up and ask questions or whatever. So I got in line to ask him a question. Don't remember what it was. And right at that minute, I was like two people from the front. My phone goes off because my dad's calling me to meet me uh, somewhere in the convention and so i'm like oh crap and i didn't it was a new phone and so i was like because it was still at the time the parents like oh phones will make your like destroy your kids and they'll be taken by (laughs) you know someone's gonna come and kidnap them or whatever so it was fairly new that my parents were like okay with me having one and so uh i like was freaking out uh and i turned it off and james agency just gave me this look because he was in the middle of answering question and then and i'm like oh okay it's fine and then it goes off again (laughs) And he turns to me as like, shut off your phone. He was so like, he was very angry. Uh, and I just got so embarrassed that I just got out of line and just like left and like met oh, my dad. No. So I never got to ask. I don't remember what it was. I never got to ask my question to poor uh, J. Michael Straczynski. And if I ever meet him, he'll probably, he won't remember me. But I always like fear that he'll hate me. <laughs> like you ruined my panel that one year. Yeah, I'm sure he wouldn't remember. Oh, I mean, sure I, I'm I'm a big fan of his too. And I'm an even yeah. bigger Babylon 5 fan than a Star Trek fan. If that's such a thing as even possible. Yeah. And and uh, I, I support him on his Patreon, uh, which is really great because he puts out stuff there before it goes anywhere else. Oh, so like we, we knew about the movie that just came out before anybody else. And, and oh, that's you know, great. Those kinds of, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. By the way, there's a there's a podcast I'm listening to where these two guys are watching Babylon 5 for the first time and they've mm-hmm. never they've never seen it. They don't know anything about what's happening. And every episode, one of my favorite parts, they try to predict what the next episode is about just based on the title. Yeah. And it's nuts. <laughs> it's, <laughs> oh, that it's, would be fun. It, it's very fun. It's very fun. Babylon 5 for the first time is what it's called. Do you very, know, I, I don't know if you know this. I actually have a Babylon 5 podcast as well. You do? Um, yeah. So I, it's on pause right now because of the ongoing SAG strike and they SAG has asked influencers to to not do like rewatch podcasts during this time to not support struck uh, productions. So sure. we're currently doing uh, The Prisoner, which is a Br- uh, British show. Also really great. Yes. Very familiar. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. But my uh, co-host and I uh, are rewatching Babylon 5. I have the sort of conceit of the podcast is one of us has seen the show. One sure. of us hasn't. So we originally did Farscape, which I hadn't seen. Um, then we went to Babylon 5 with my co-host Vera hasn't seen. So we're going through that right now. We're in season three. We just finished the the Shadow War. We're starting in with the Earth stuff. Um, or sorry, yeah, season four. Is what, yeah, season that, four. That's sorry, season four, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's season four is what I meant. And uh, yeah, so we're on pause right now, just as the Stag Strike's going on. But as soon as the Stag Strike's back, we'll be going back. So I do have a podcast it's called the Jump Gate Podcast. So. Oh, that's fantastic. All right, I'll, I will check it out. Yeah, I have yeah. Um, all the script books that JMS oh, sold. Wow. I have all the... 
all the things you know that he put out through his through his own company. Um, yeah. And what's really cool is there's a, a bonus book, uh, volume 15, that you had to subscribe and get all the books to get the bonus book. You, you, yeah. He never sold the bonus book separately. And that has his original outlines for the show going back to the 80s. Oh, that's uh, so cool. So, yeah, you can read like the original pitches. Not that even they were before they were even pitches. Like yeah, his he, original, he, he, like, yeah, he just had like some outlines that he was just putting together. Right? Yeah, some yeah. treatments, you know. Yeah. yeah, and it's you can kind of see the bones of what developed later. I mean, it yeah. wasn't what we got. It was something a little different. But I mean, the scope and the scale of it was there. It's just yeah. it, it was a little bit different story. So at, that's it's amazing stuff. If you ever get the chance to look at that. No, that would be so. great because I'm, I'm currently coming up with my own pitches for, for stuff. And so that's always cool to like see the development of that and just see what else other people did. So that's really cool. Oh, yeah. You can see the DNA of all of that. So. All right. Uh, so we were talking about Hall H. Uh, you were yes. telling me about meeting Joe Straczynski. What other convention experience did you have at San Diego Comic-Con? So this was just a fun one um, that I, I, I didn't even realize until later. But because um, I've since met him and, and, and know him decently well nowadays. But uh, there was the, you know, at Hall H, they have the like signing area and sort of the middle of the different halls in that like big open amphitheater area. And so I was hanging out there and, you know, that and I was a big Trekkie, but that was the time like that was sort of the dead air time of Star Trek. I think like at the time, like I think Star Trek 2009 was just starting to ramp up and they were trying to build up hype for it. Like I got a foam. I think actually the foam finger back there is actually from that con experience. Uh, it's a nice. like, 2009 foam finger of the Vulcan salute um, for listeners. I have a foam finger on the wall behind me. And uh, but so there wasn't a lot of Star Trek stuff. And the only person signing at the time that was Star Trek related was and I didn't know who this was at the time, but it was Larry Nemechek, um, Dr. Nice. Trek, as people know him. Um, yeah. And so I went up to him and I, I started talking to him because he ran Star Trek Communicator at the time or he was one of the people on Star Trek Communicator, which is the Star Trek magazine. And I told him the story and I don't think he remembers it. I've told him the sense, but. I used to have the Star Trek Communicator magazine I bring into school, and there was one issue that said sex in Star Trek that was like had a picture of Jerry Ryan and her cat suit or whatever on the cover. And I sure. got made fun of a lot for that having that magazine in because we was like, Jesse brought in Star Trek porn or whatever was like the thing <laughs> that my friend my friends were talking about. So I got I got bullied for that comic or for that for that issue of the magazine. And I told oh, Larry no. that and he was super he was super supportive. And then I had him sign my um San Diego Comic Con um uh, it was like the, the the like packs of all the panels and stuff or whatever. So I had them sign that. And I had a bunch of other people sign the cast of Futurama. It was the first reboot that they were doing for Comedy Central at the time. Um, they signed that and everything. And I was recently going through and I have I still have that like that book with all the signatures on it. And I had written down as a kid everyone who had signed it. And I wrote Larry Nemechek. And I didn't I didn't remember like I remember the story, but I didn't know it was Larry. And so I, I recently told him I was like, yeah, oh, I didn't realize this, but I had met you years ago. Because, yeah, he and I catch each other at conventions and stuff nowadays, and we know each other at least decently well, at least within the Trekkie mm-hmm. sphere. Um, so, yeah, it was just it was just a weird little serendipitous story. And it, it feels very apropos that um, the thing that I told him about as a little kid was that I got bullied for sex and like a sex and Star Trek comic, considering literally my job and what I'm known for in the Trek community is like big videos on sex and sexuality in Star Trek nowadays. So it feels <laughs> feels like it was uh, presaging something. So, oh, see, there you go. It it all began with yeah. Jerry Ryan in a cat suit on the front of the magazine, and now look at you, right? <laughs> exactly. And, and we, we, we know who to, we know who to give the credit to. Yeah, I was gonna yeah, say blame, blame but that Larry, wouldn't be right. <laughs> yeah, blame, blame Larry Larry Nemechek. <laughs> all right, Doctor Trek, you're on notice. So, uh, you go to San Diego Comic Con. What was your first exclusive Star Trek convention? So my my first exclusive Star Trek convention was actually really recently. It was uh, Star Trek Mission Chicago that happened what. Two years ago, a year and a half ago, somewhere in that vicinity. Something like that, yeah, two years uh, yeah. ago, yeah. Yeah, that was my very first, like, solo Star Trek convention. Uh, just because, you know, when I was younger, I did, like, I, there wasn't any big conventions near where I grew up. Like, SDCC was, like, the big one that I got to go to once. Um, and then I just haven't been able to go to... I've been going to conventions now that I'm older, but it's been more general ones, like Los Angeles Comic Con or Emerald City Comic Con in, in Seattle. Nothing mm-hmm. Star Trek-specific. So Mission Chicago was my very first one, um, and it was... Uh, I, I have a video on my secondary channel where I go through everything, but it was it was absolutely amazing. It was uh, it was just it was it was just like the sweetest thing to like be around Trekkies and be around something that was like so positive and so kind and people just being very supportive and mm-hmm. loving this weird thing that we all loved. Um, uh, I, I got to I was very honored to meet because it was um, 
uh, right around Star Trek Lower Deck season two, I believe. And and uh, I learned that Mike McMahon like enjoyed my uh, my reviews, you know, and so he came up to me and, and said such sweet things. And it was super kind. I met Jack Quaid and Tawny Newsom were also said they enjoyed the reviews like that was that was a wild moment for me. Like that was just a, a dream come true. So that that was my my first uh, like Star Trek exclusive convention. So I I I, I will never forget that convention because it was just it was everything I wanted it to be. So yeah, I was I was a little disappointed because I was going to go to the one they were supposed to have in Seattle. And, I know uh, got yeah. canceled. Yeah, it worked I out. Was... I mean, the dates worked perfectly for my life. There was just it like that exact weekend was amazing. Like I couldn't have timed it better, and yeah, it went nowhere. So. Yeah, I, think, I literally I, I was living in Seattle. Yeah, I was literally living in Seattle at the time, so I was like, "This is perfect. I can take people around, bring them to my bars. I don't have to buy a hotel." And yeah, and then it didn't go. So, but then you started going to STLV. Yeah, and that's where that's where I think we officially met. So uh, yes, yeah, yeah. And, and so, have you been to one or two? That was my STLVs. first one. That was my first STLV that I've ever been to. All right. So for those who've not been to the either mission or STLV, why don't you com- give me your First, uh, compare and contrast. Give me your impressions of how they're the same and how they're different. Of Mission and STLV? Yeah. I, for me, I mean, STLV was definitely, I mean, since it's no longer the official one, I knew it was the official up until like a year, like a couple of years ago. Um, but having not been the official one, it definitely felt a little less corporatized in a lot of ways. And it was also oh, yeah. weird this year, too, because they the SAG and the WGA strikes were going on, too. Uh, and I actually kind of like... You know, as much as, you know, I support those both strikes and I'm glad that the WGA got what they, they wanted and well-deserved. And I think these SAG actors deserve as well. But there was also some really cool, it was a cool experience as a con because the actors couldn't really specifically talk about Star Trek, mm-hmm. which I actually kind of like because it, it kind of, it allowed people to ask questions more about the actors themselves. And not to say, like, I I get, I will ask these questions as well, but there's usually a big amount of questions at cons like this about, like, the minutia of, like, what did you think about this episode? da 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 and so then instead of asking, you have to ask questions like, how do you feel? What's your like, well, how do you think about acting? Like that was a much, like, I think it was just a more interesting vibe. And, and I think STLV, I think being a queer uh, Star Trek fan, for me, I felt like STLV still had a little bit of the like Vegas kind of older boys club kind of feel to it a little bit mm-hmm. in my mind. And that's not a, not necessarily a judgment, but I felt like. Mission to Chicago had a little bit more of the like queer vibe going on to me. Okay. Um, but again, it's, I think that's just also comes part and parcel with Vegas a little bit. And also the fact that uh, SDLV has been going on for like how many years. So I think yeah, it's also a, a little time. bit of an, yeah, a little bit of an institution versus Mission to Chicago. I mean, queer people like to be like, it's something new. We'll take it over with rainbow colors, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so very good. Yeah. I, yeah. you can really see the difference, um, in STLVs as a long time STLV goer, um, from when they lost the license. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it made it better to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, only because you get to see some really weird stuff that you wouldn't yeah. necessarily see that CBS wouldn't approve. Uh, so like, just as an example, right. We had an Orville panel, which you wouldn't get. Oh yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. yeah. If, if it was still licensed, uh, you, you see lots more weird stuff in the vendors room. I mean, I always love the weird get, stuff. So yeah, yeah. There's just a lot more weird programming, uh, which I enjoy. So I, I, I really like it. So if people haven't been to STLV, you should definitely check it out. I, I would highly recommend it. It was a lot of fun uh, on all rounds. So. so I know you have a lot of Star Trek uniforms because I see them in your YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you consider yourself a cosplayer at all? I. Yes and no. So yes, in the sense that I have a lot of costumes, like literally uh, you can't see it on the, our video. It's slightly off there, but that closet right there, I have two. This is my office and then I have mm-hmm. a bedroom. My office has its own closet and that's literally filled with costumes. Like half of it's Star Trek costumes. I have one for ev- at least one for every show, probably multiple for many. And, and, and then a bunch more on top of that for like videos and things that I do. And so, yeah, I would consider myself a cosplayer in that sense, in that I I do cosplay a bunch. Mm-hmm. But uh, my friend, and you may know her as well, Spotted Giraffe, who's on the yes, Strange of course. Yeah, she she makes all of her like she makes very elaborate cosplay oh, yeah. stuff. And she's I, fantastic. I, yeah, I mainly just buy my costumes. Like I'll buy something and maybe add a, like I'll put together a bunch of different things, but I'll never really do any like making of them. Um, and she makes them, and so I I always toss it to like I I feel like. I feel like when you're talking about like professional, professional cosplayers, like there mm-hmm. are people who put a lot of effort into like making stuff. And that's that's not me just just piece out of time. Like, I don't have the time to do that. So I, I will say I'm a cosplayer, but I wouldn't necessarily put myself as like on the echelon of someone like Spotted Draft, who is just like leagues above and, and deservedly so. Oh, yeah. She's she's next level. Have you done anything besides uniforms? 
Yeah, I mean, I have, uh, in terms of Star Trek stuff, like I did a Tendi, like pirate Tendi cosplay. Nice. Which was fun because I had to make myself all green instead of just my face green. And then, uh, I mean, I've done a bunch of other like video game characters. Like, um, who did I do? I'm trying to remember who it was. I did like um, uh, Gordon Freeman from Half-Life 2. I did years ago for, I think, for uh, Los Angeles Comic-Con. Nice. I did uh, Harley Quinn um, because I'm a big Harley Quinn fan as well. So, yeah, I've done I've done besides just Star Trek uniforms. So when did you decide that you were going to get into this whole nerd uh, YouTube arena and start putting up YouTube videos about Star Trek in addition to many other things as well? But what what brought that on? Um, So I'd always done YouTube since I was a little kid. I did like I recorded music like my my early. This is how I knew I was going to get into film was like I used to like do um, music video edits. Okay. Of uh, like Doctor Who episodes or things like that, because I was also in the Doctor Who fandom. And that was what was going on at the time. Um, Like, I think they're not they're not they're not uh, they're not available on my channel anymore. But you could find uh, like uh, if I could turn back time, like songs like that to like (laughs) Doctor Who. So there's like that was that was like my old uh, my old YouTube channel. So I'd always had like a YouTube channel when I was growing up and putting stuff randomly on it, mm-hmm. Stargate Atlantis stuff as well. But I didn't really do anything in earnest until when I moved to LA. It was right after I came out as trans. So I came out as trans right at the end of my college years, and I stayed in my college town for a little while to transition, and then I uh, moved to LA after that, and I started doing a podcast slash video thing that I think is still up on my channel called Trans Nerdy Podcast. Where I would okay. do like I would talk about two different topics, um, very low rent, like I just barely like could barely use any of equipment or whatever, and I would just talk about a right, trans right. topic and a nerdy topic, and that would be the 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 show. Uh, didn't get any viewers or whatever, but I did that for a little while, and then I got a job at the Advocate, which is um, uh, if anyone knows, it's an LGBTQ magazine, a very famous LGBTQ magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, the company it's is called Pride Media. Time. Yeah, yeah, it's been for a very 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 long time. They also the company also runs Out Magazine, Pride.com, The Advocate. So I, I was working at kind of all of those. I got a job on their video department, and it was really it was such a wonderful experience because they were so supportive and their video team was so new that like we really got to experiment and try a bunch of different things. And they were really open about uh, allowing us to have a kind of our own voices in in it and and try and do new things. And one of the things that I started to find that I was really enjoying was I enjoyed doing um, kind of that same sort of thing of like talking about nerdy issues through a queer lens Mm -hmm. and that started to do decently well for for pride.com specifically which is their younger aimed channel um but i also knew like i like doing news related stuff i like writing about like ongoing topics that's what i did with the advocate aspect of things so they're a news magazine and so but i also wanted to hone and learn how best to uh hone my own voice and and make my own things and i I started to learn like the best way to do that to like learn what you wanted to say and how you wanted to say it and to improve your skills just to make things just to keep making things and try things out and see what works see what didn't refine what you do and so i decided you know what i'm just gonna try and do youtube videos one a week like every week every friday i would release another youtube video it would just be on whatever a star trek topic whatever and so just just to be making things just to see like how to make things get in the process of doing it and process of writing all the time like just getting into that habit mm-hmm. and yeah slowly but surely it started taking off you know, I got a job at Microsoft after that, working on their YouTube channel for about a half a year. So that was working, working well. And then I just kept making things. And eventually it just, uh, just, you know, I was able to make a living off of it. And here we are. So. Oh, that's great. So yeah. about how much time every week are you spending on, on YouTube content, on, <laughs> on content creation in general? Oh, on content creation in general, uh, all of it. Uh, pretty much all of my time. I, I spend, uh, I will, I'm a late sleeper, so I I will get up around like 10 or 11, have breakfast, mm-hmm. and then I'll spend pretty much all the day working on stuff. If I have a video coming out, I'll be up till 2 a.m. editing sometimes. I probably need to do better about the work-life balance is kind of my problem. Lately, it's been a little bit different just because I'm working on a film that's actually, we're actually going to be uh, filming literally in a week. I'm kind of uh, having <laughs> nervous uh, moments about that. Uh, oh, but dear. literally, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. But yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, we can talk about it later, but it's a, it's a sci-fi film that actually stars uh, John Delancey of all people. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. And so uh, that's my main focus right now. So I, I'm focusing less on YouTube stuff. So I'm still doing that. Um, but I've been focusing more and more on getting that film out the door over the past few weeks. But generally, I spend pretty much all of my free time doing doing that and working on uh, working on YouTube stuff and content creation and then trying to find time for friends and, and family and video games in between. So. 
One of the things that's come up coincidentally on the show is I've talked a little bit about the behind the scenes of podcasting and sort of how much effort goes into just making this audio product. So mm -hmm. I just want to ask you as a video content creator, if you're making a 30 minute video, best guess off the top of your head, how many, how many hours Ooh. does it take you to make a 30 minute YouTube video? 30 minute YouTube video? Yeah. I all mean, the prep time, all the, the recording, editing, all of that. Yeah. I mean, it, de it depends. It depends on what it is. Cause sometimes I've done videos that I just like write it quick and get it out. Cause it's on a very prescient topic. Um, like, you know, if there's an issue that's like, uh, I need to be talking about it, I can write it, edit, shoot it and get it done in like a day or two days. And that's very like low, low rent. Like I'll put up some quote screens or whatever that I can get out in two days. If it's like a production, which I've been doing more and more and more and trying to be like, I'm going to have a costume. There's going to be a theme. I'm going to try and shoot it with nice lights. Um, it's going to be a very like thoughtful video essay that will take, uh, honestly uh it can take up to a month to to two months to do it sometimes there's one i'm working on right now that's a big video on the sort of politics of star wars it's going to be a really long video that i've been working on for three or four months now it's sort of been in the background it's been a spinning plate that i've been doing while i have other stuff going on so uh it, it can vary i would say on average i would say about a month if it's like a really good production but yeah it can vary anywhere from like two days to to like, I guess at three, four or five months. So yeah, the, the only reason I ask is because every now and then I get people who ask me about starting podcasts and, and sort of what's involved in it. And I always caution them. I say it takes a lot more time than you think it does. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, whatever audio production takes video is, is many hours times. Oh that. yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I will say like the things where it's like two minutes for me, like two minutes, two days for me, like the videos that I do in two days, that's after like years of practice at that. Like I've gotten good of being able to edit really quickly. I have like things that I have set up that like, oh, I, I know what this needs to look like really quick. So I can make it in two seconds. Whereas the first time i did it, it would take like a whole day just to do that part of it so yeah it's 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 it takes a lot of practice to get that fast so i think it's time to talk about some episodes are you ready i am ready let's do it all right well first i want to revisit something uh, we'd already mm -hmm. talked about the star trek nemesis audiobook is there anything mm -hmm. else you want to say about it that we didn't say before how it was a sort of your your entree into star trek yeah, I mean, we kind of touched upon all aspects uh, of it just earlier, but it was it was the reason I sent it to you is like the thing I want to talk about is because I do think it is just a weird spot to come into Star Trek because it is an audiobook and it's also Star Trek Nemesis, which, if I'm being honest, is my least favorite Star Trek movie. I actually think it's the worst Star Trek movie. It's usually at the bottom of my list for for a myriad of reasons, but probably the most prominent of which is the uh, the treatment of Troy in that movie particularly. Oh, it's uh, terrible. Is, yeah, it's absolutely atrocious. Uh, but there's also many other reasons to not like that movie. So, like, I, I have a really warm spot for the audiobook, though, because the audiobook, I think, actually, like, does a better job, and, and the novel, if, if we're being honest, too, um, does a better job of, like, really respecting the characters, drawing out the themes a lot more. And, mm -hmm. and like I said, the reason I mentioned the audiobook is just because it's where I came into Star Trek. Um, it gave me my love of not only just uh, not only just Star Trek Two, but you know, a love of audio drama. You know, I mentioned briefly, like I my dream job would be to do audio dramas for for Star Trek, and I don't say that lightly. Like I'm a like I want to be a filmmaker and things like that. But if someone said you want to do just audio dramas, I would love that because um, for me, I think audio dramas are such a cool medium because it it has all the stuff I kind of love about filmmaking, which is you work with actors, you get to be creative. It's a collaborative experience. But I think there's also an element of cool collaborative experience with the with the audience as well. Because when you're doing film, everything like you're basically presenting everything to the audience, right? They are they are there, and they just get back and watch the visuals, the like music, like everything's there for them. And you can do a lot of really cool things with that. About like using like I, the movie I'm working on, like the visuals are going to be telling a very particular story, even if you don't hear any of the dialogue or anything like that. But with audio dramas, like because it is because it's just audio the visuals are part of the imagination that the listener puts forth. And so it's kind of gets a little bit of the best of both worlds of, um, of, uh, audio and, um, uh, uh, books and film because you get the collaborative medium, but you also still get to be, uh, the listener still gets to like have all this cool imagination that they bring into it. And you can also do, you don't have to have a huge budget for audio to like say, Oh, thing explodes. Uh, you don't have to pay any money for that. You just make an explosion sound effect. Right on. So I, I always love that. And I think that that's partially also too, why Star Trek Nemesis audiobook is, it means a lot to me because when I listened to it, I didn't see, I hadn't seen Nemesis the movie. 
So like the Remans were just like these like terrifying creatures in my brain, you know, instead mm-hmm. of Ron Perlman in a suit, um, you know, like the, this, the, the battle of the scimitar versus the Enterprise was just this cool visual thing that they were talking about, like them ramming each other, which is so evocative. So yeah, I, I just, I, I have a particular love of Nemesis, the audiobook. So. I think one of the things that, that goes through my mind when I watch it is that I've since in the intervening years become such a huge fan of Tom Hardy. Yeah. And yeah. I think what an incredible talent that man yeah. is. Uh, yeah. I've seen him in so many things. And when I watch it, I think, man, they just, you know, I, he might've been just maybe too, too early in his career or the, or the director just couldn't get it out of him or, or what, you know, Probably I, I don't know where a, the, a little bit of B. Yeah. yeah. It might be both, but I just keep thinking this is like buying a Ferrari and driving it around the parking lot in first gear, man. You know, mm-hmm. like he could have done so much better in that. If, if the winds had shifted a little bit, you know, and, and things. Honestly. Just, yeah. I would have loved like a Venom style performance. Like Tom Hardy, I think is a great actor. Like there's some, like Locke, I think is a great movie of his. That's just, Oh my God. Car. I yeah. love that movie. <laughs> it is phenomenal. I adore that movie. Like Locke is great. If you listen, if you have not seen Locke, it is literally just Tom Hardy driving a car for two hours and it, it will emotionally devastate you. Yeah, so, um, and he takes, and he takes cell phone calls. That's yeah, it. That's, that's, that's the movie. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> it's wonderful. So he is a great talent, but I would have liked, uh, I, I, I think it would have just improved the movie tenfold if in Nemesis he had given a performance like he gave in Venom, which like Venom, not a good movie, but it is it is enjoyable based on the over-the-top performance that Tom Hardy's just given his all to. And if he had done that for Shinzon and just like, just like screw it, go a little over the top uh, with Shinzon, I think it would have made a much more fun film. Yeah, or I see the depths that he does in uh, Peaky Blinders uh, playing mm-hmm. Mr. Solomon. You know, he's just, he's so good. Um, and I, I just, when I watch Nemesis, I think, man, they, they, this guy could have been like on a whole nother level in this, but ah, regrets. Alas. Alas. So let's talk about another movie. Let's talk about the 2009 Star Trek. So tell me about this one, Jesse. What's going on? I, you mentioned earlier that you'd mm-hmm. gone with some friends to go see it. So, yeah. so tell me what's going on with this one here for you. So the reason that 2009 was on my list um, was for that reason. It was the first time I got to see Star Trek in theaters because mm-hmm. I, I didn't get to see Nemesis because that was the last one that had come out and it came out right when I was getting into Star Trek. So I never really got to yep. go to the theater to see it. And so 2009 was the first time I got to see Star Trek in theaters and i was so excited i remember i remember all the hype going into that i mean that was jj abrams like jj abrams controversial figure today uh but at the time you know i remember he just coming off a lost he had done alias he had i think fringe was right around the corner i don't know if it had come out just yet he he had, he was like the guy for like science fiction stuff it was like him and joss whedon you know and joss whedon's controversial for very different reasons oh, yeah, nowadays. yeah <laughs> uh yeah um but uh but you know so i was so pumped and i remember like they released that teaser trailer where they were building the Enterprise uh, right before yeah. 2009 came out. I, I, I went like they showed that with Cloverfield and that, Cloverfield's a good movie. But I went to that movie four times in theaters just to watch that teaser trailer of them like <laughs> to build the Enterprise like 10, 15 seconds. I was I was so excited for this film. And then the other element of it, too, that has just become a really important part of what Star Trek means to me today is that Star Trek 2009 was the first time I got to share Star Trek with friends. Because, you know, growing up, Star Trek was, you know, I got bullied a lot as a nerd. Mm-hmm. Um, you yeah. know, I was, I was, it was made fun of a lot. And so I didn't really, uh, didn't really get to share Star Trek with anybody. Like even my brother and my sister, like they weren't really ever into Star Trek. So like, it was just a kind of just a thing that I enjoyed by myself. And so Star Trek 2009, by that point, I was still in high school, but I went to a K through 12 school. And so by the time we were in high school, like we had known each other for 13 years. My bully, my bully at the, who had bullied me in kindergarten or whatever, was like a friend now. Like we were all, we were all chill at that point, you know, uh, Stockholm syndrome, maybe. <laughs> uh, but we were all, <laughs> right we were, on. But we were all friends. And so, you know, at that point I had friends who were like, we don't like Star Trek, but we'll go for you. And so we went to see the movie and it was just, I, I still remember like finishing the movie and being so overwhelmed, like seeing Leonard Nimoy on screen as his, you know, Into Darkness aside, his last like on screen, like appearance of Spock and, and it, the movie, I, I really stand by like, yes, there are logic gaps taken in that film in terms of like, why, uh, why is the supernova able to blow up an entire Roman empire? Who knows? Uh, let's not wonder what red matter is. Let's not worry about that. So like, yes, there are logic gaps in the film, but I do think it is just, uh, I think the performances are so amazing. I think it is, I think it is a really beautiful film and emotionally, they have some really great like moments story-wise. I think, uh, it's just a lot of fun. I, I, and I will argue too that, um, JJ Abrams, you know, 
my problem with J.J. Abrams as a filmmaker in the in last few years, he's he he is he wants to play, he's the guy who likes to play with his action figures. He likes to play mm-hmm. like Force Awakens, Rise of Skywalker. They're films where it's like he's very clearly just aping Star Wars, and he's not really adding anything new. He's just doing it again. And even Super 8, which is very like referential to Spielberg, is a film that he did kind of the same thing. It's not really doing anything new. It's doing it again. But with Star Trek, uh, especially 2009, he he I, I feel like he because he was not a Trekkie. I think he was able to do something. He was able to update it in, I think, a really cool way. I think the visual language of those films, people knock it uh, nowadays, but I think it was... Lens flare. I, yeah, exactly. Lens flare with like, jazz hands. <laughs> exactly. Overdone it into darkness, for sure. But I think in 2009, I think it, it, it had a vibrancy and a distinct style that, like, I don't think you even see in, in a lot of blockbusters today. A lot of blockbusters today feel very samey and have the mm-hmm. same sheen and everything's a beam to the sky at the end, you know? Uh, even though Star Trek 2009 does have a beam to the sky. I don't know. Like, I, I see Star Trek 2009 and I see I see a visual flair and I, fe- I see an inventiveness that I don't think J.J. Abrams has really done since. And I don't think blockbusters have really done since. So I, I, I think on so many levels of like, I was just so excited for it personally. It's great to see in theaters. I got to go with friends. Um, it was, it was. Uh, I think I will stand by that movie of like, yeah, sure, there are things in it that I can see why people don't like this type of Star Trek, um, and I think that's fair. But for me, I, I think there's so much I love about it. It, it seems like you're of the opinion that it's one of his best films. I would argue so. I would argue that it's one of, if not, I'd have to look at his filmography uh, in front of me. But I, I would argue it's definitely up there. I think it's better than all the Star Wars movies. Better than Into Darkness, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> better, better than Super 8. Um, I would even argue probably better than Mission Impossible 3, which many people consider his best. And while I do like Mission Impossible 3, I would even argue it's not even one of the better Mission Impossibles. So I, I would say it's definitely his best, if not one of his best films. So Let's talk about another audiobook. Uh, yeah. you, are definitely, you are definitely Miss Audiobook here. So let's yeah. talk about Spock vs. Q. So for those who don't know, this, of mm-hmm. course, is a live recording of uh, Leonard Nimoy and John DeLancey sort of doing this sort of audio play that came out, I want to say, in the late 90s on mm-hmm. audio CD. So tell me what's going on with this particular one. What's so, what's going on for you? So I I fell in love with, like I told you, the Star Trek audiobooks. Mm-hmm. And um, so whenever I would go to like thrift stores or whatever, I would always look for the audiobooks that were there. And I found at one this Spock versus Q audiobook that I had never heard of before. Um, and yeah, for those, they, as you just said, it's a it's a kind of comedy sketch that um, yes. Spock and Spock and uh, Leonard Nimoy and John Delancey kind of did where they sort of uh, it's just sort of like they they kind of like, uh, you know, they kind of like try to one up each other the entire time where like Spock's trying to save Earth and Q is coming down to kind of make fun of him. It's like, you don't break the prime directive, Spock, because he's the conceit is that Spock's gone back in time and talking to the people like the audience that people that they're performing to are like the present day audience of Earth. So he can't break the prime directive. And so Spock's trying to like logic his way out of like breaking the prime directive and everything. And it's just it's a very fun sort of comedy bit. I listen to this thing to death. Like I over and over and over again, like I still listen to it today um, wow. to like help me fall asleep. Like, I, cause I, I listen to audiobooks to go to bed to, um, and I still listen to it today. And it's just, it's, it's a weird comfort to me. Um, and I just, I, I think it's just like this, it, it goes into what we were kind of already were talking about, right? Like he's like weird aspects of the franchise. Like everyone knows best of both worlds. Everyone knows trouble. With sure. Trials. But what I love about Star Trek is there's all these like weird little corners of it. Yeah. And I think Spock versus Q is one of those, still one of those weird ones that no one really talks about. And I, I still, I have such a love for it. And then kind of bouncing off of it too, is that Spock versus Q uh, audiobook was made by uh, Leonard Nimoy and John DeLancey made in uh, a sort of audio drama company called Alien Voices. So mm-hmm. they made Spock vs. Q. They also made one called Spock vs. Q, the sequel. But then on which top is of- insane, by the way. Oh, that was is, it's, so it's a body good. swap where, where, oh, yeah. where Spock and Q body swap. That's all. Mm-hmm. That's all. That's all we'll say about it. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's Let's all we'll say. say about it. Go listen Leonard to it. Leonard Nimoy it's and John DeLancey have a lot of fun with that one. That one's yeah, that one's great. In fact, even better than the first one. Um. But uh, but yeah, so that one, they made that. But then they also did audio dramas of a bunch of different science fiction novels, mainly H.G. Wells. 
Um, so they did like the Time Machine, the First Man on the Moon, um, the Lost World. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, uh, the Invisible Man, a couple other ones as well. Um, War of the Worlds, I think they did as well. And they did it with a bunch of Star Trek alums. So like, you know, Brent Spiner, Andrew Robinson, uh, Ethan Phillips, Kate Mulgrew. They had like a whole bunch of folks from from across the Star Trek era. And these these audio dramas, like we would, I already spent a lot of time extolling my love of audio drama, but these audio dramas are so good and so well performed and so um just uh so moody they have just such a great mood to them i, I even think like they're the time machine that they do uh the version of the time machine mm-hmm. is so scary like there's the sequence where um the time traveler goes into the the morlock um underground morlock area and it is leonard nimoy is it is terrifying it is absolutely terrifying i still listen to this day and i get creeped out by, by if i listen to it at night and so I, I just, I love these audio dramas. And I, I actually, as I mentioned earlier, I'm working on um, a film that John mm-hmm. Delancey is in. And I had the pleasure of, of getting to say to him, you know, I didn't tell him this is the first thing. Because I was like, first I was like, I want to be a professional. You know, that's, this is my movie. Here's the themes. You know, we're being a very professional director talking to a very professional actor. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, after we've gotten to know, like, we're not close buddies. But, you know, you know, after we've talked to each other, had a few rehearsals, I just sort of mentioned, like, hey, I just want to say, like, I know, you know, I'm a Trekkie. That's how we got connected. But I, I do want to say that, like, these audio dramas that you did really meant the world to me as a kid because they are what got me into from like you know i think i think star trek is such a great gateway franchise into so many other things in, into science fiction like it gets you into science fiction and then you're like you know i want to i want to explore this aspect of science fiction more that star trek you know brushes upon but doesn't go deep into so you go off into like you know stargate Battlestar galactica all that stuff sure but what got me into like classic science fiction like hg wells or isaac asimov was these audio dramas uh, that they did, and they they're still so meaningful to me today. I still listen to them today, and so I got to tell that to John Delancey, and I think he was a little bit surprised that I I knew about them. Um, and so it was it was it was a very special moment to me that I had very recently that I got to tell him how much uh, that particularly meant to me. So I I love those the Spock versus Q. I picked that because it was the Star Trek one, but the whole sort of Alien Voices audio drama thing that they did was uh was particularly meaningful to me. So. He he kept on doing that kind of stuff on uh, several different in several different venues. Um, mm-hmm. The one I'm thinking of in particular is the Star Trek cruise. Mm-hmm. So he's been a, a routine guest, a routine repeat guest, and he does this Lost World, yeah, yeah. Uh, show, yeah. And he's done that with with the other actors involved and with uh, people from uh, fans, basically providing sound effects, you know, and working yeah. with him in the rehearsals and stuff like that. And he's done that the last couple times. It's uh, it's been great just yeah. watching it. And you know, it's not Star Trek related at all, but we love it. <laughs> Yeah, I heard I heard you did a performance on the I, I wasn't there, but uh, they did a version of Spock versus Q with Ethan Peck performing Spock. And I was like, oh, man, I would have killed for an audio recording of that. Just to listen to that. I would have loved it. Let's talk about some lower decks. Let's talk about Wedge Douche. <laughs> so this, of course, is the one where we have the lower decks on all the different races, right? We have Klingon lower decks, so we've got mm. Paklid lower decks, and we even get Borg lower decks, which I thought was just the cherry on top of the whole thing. But I, I want to know about your point of view on this episode and why it was so special for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, included this episode, and then there's another episode, too, that we'll talk about in just a minute from Lower Decks. But I wanted to, when we had a list, uh, talk about Lower Decks specifically and why I loved it. And I think... Up until this, the other one we're talking about, this was my favorite episode of Lower Decks overall. I, um, But Lower Decks is, in particular, I think my favorite Star Trek show on right now. Um, mm-hmm. and, and certainly probably Vi's for my favorite Star Trek show overall with uh, probably Deep Space Nine would be the other one that we'll talk about in a bit. Oh, uh, very, very different. <laughs> you got very, a strong contrast there. <laughs> yeah, very different. But what I what I love about Lower Decks it, and why it means the absolute world to me is it, on the surface, it is just a Star Trek show that is in, as excited and is in love with Star Trek as I am. Like, I think every mm-hmm. Trekkie feels this, right? Like, it, it's a show that's like, every Trekkie is just so passionate and excited about Star Trek and, like, the characters on Lower Decks feel exactly the same way in-universe about, like, getting excited about Kirk, Picard, you know, all of them. And I, I just, I, I love that like just that level of the show. But what I love, I think most about Lower Decks and why it's a particular show that just speaks so much to me is even beneath the like excitement about Star Trek, which, you know, is, is very worthwhile and I adore it and I love all these tricks, but it's also a show that just is earnestly kind in a way that I don't see many other shows 
doing even star trek shows like star trek shows have always been very like earnestly optimistic and and hopeful Mm -hmm. and and meaningful but there's just a kindness in star trek lower decks that i just i i i i just want to always pursue in my own life and i'll talk a little bit more about this with the character of tendy in the next episode we get to because Mm -hmm. she in particular is one that means a lot to me but just Lower Decks just always has this, like, everyone is just so kind. And it's always about being kind. And it's always about supporting kindness. And I think we really need that a lot today, about remind, reminding ourselves that humanity really can be and pursue kindness as our main focus. With a, lot of, a lot of systems and things that we have today don't really encourage that. Mm-hmm. But I think at our core, human beings are kind. And I think Lower Decks just capture that in such a beautiful way. And so to get into Weed's Dude, the reason I put that on the list is I do think that that is probably the best episode of the show because it, it it captures all of that kindness, but it also captures that in different uh, species as well. Like it captures that in the Klingons, it captures that with the Lynn and the Vulcans. It, it just has that sort of like cross-cultural uh, love of infinite diversity and infinite combinations that Star Trek is about. And the episode just by doing it on the lower decks aspect of it, it just showcases like, yeah, they're different cultures. And yeah, they are different in terms of like they have different beliefs, different values. And we, that's amazing. That's a beautiful thing to understand. But there's also similarities. There's also the same struggles. You know, Talin has similar struggles to Mariner, for example. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Klingon boy, the Klingon uh, main character on the Klingon ship has a similar story to Boimler, you know. And so there, there's these, these resonances across cultures that we can all connect to. I think captures that. It's also very funny. Um, it manages to tell like three, like three or four distinct stories in a single episode, despite it only be twenty two minutes, which I always respect. Lower decks for it just does so much with so little time. Um, and each one uh, of those episodes feels like they're forty five minutes. Or it, longer. They, really, they, really really, they really do. They really do. And so yeah, for, for I, I just think Weege Dooge, I, I think just is it captures just so much of why i love lower decks why i love star trek and then it's just also its own little weird unique beast of an episode and, and so i just i think it's i love it i love it so much so you made reference to another episode from lower decks something borrowed something green so let's mm-hmm. talk about that one yeah this of course is the one where we go to the orion homeworld and we have tendy with uh, going to a wedding where she's expected to play a part and talin and mariner hitch along uh, for the ride. And then we have this whole weird Mark Twain plot with uh, Rutherford and Boimler back on the ship. So tell me what's going on with this one for you. So for listeners who, who don't know, you had asked me to do this podcast um, before before the recent season of Lower Decks, but I got the screeners and I saw mm-hmm. this episode and I told you, let's wait until this one comes out so we can talk about this episode. Because I saw this one and it just meant the world to me on so many levels. So I, I made reference to Tendi. Tendi is, I think... Perhaps besides Jedzia Dax, um, is my favorite character in all of Star Trek. Jedzia means a lot to me. We'll talk about that in the next episode that we'll get to um, on our list. But Tendi, you know, I talked about the kindness of Lower Decks. Tendi epitomizes that. She is the sweetest, kindest human being. Um, or Orion, I should say. Not human being. <laughs> I was going to uh, correct you. Not a human yeah, being. <laughs> yeah. So she's the sweetest person. Um, like I just go back to that season one episode where the, you know, Rutherford loses his memory in the finale. And then she says, you know what this means? We get to learn to become friends all over again. Like she just has this, this joy and excitement about the world. And yet she's so curious about the world. She always loves to explore and, and see new things. And, and yet she's also overcaring almost to a fault of her friends of like, she sometimes will be overbearing on them or like defend them with her life. Um, you know, even turning into giant scorpion monsters to get them to listen to her. Um, Indeed. So uh, she just, she's just a character that just like, a, like I would even get tattooed on my body. What would Tendi do? Because like every situation is like, what would she do? Um, and so I, I love her to death. And I have always had this running theory. And, and again, I realize it's, a, it's a, to me. Mm-hmm. I've had this running theory that she's transgender um, because okay. I'm trans. And the reason I say that is... You know, she makes reference to the fact that she has a dead name, the Mistress of the Winter Constellations. She doesn't like people calling her that um, in the in like we get that early in season two. And uh, she makes reference to the fact that she doesn't have uh, pheromones, which a lot of Orion women have. You know, they sort of, you know, if you learned in Enterprise, which is it's not a good episode, 
but you learn uh, they're problematic for many reasons. Uh, but we learn in that episode that Orion women have pheromones, but Tendi says she doesn't or doesn't use them at the very least. And so I sort of always had canon that's like, well, maybe she's trans, and so maybe she doesn't have the ability to use pheromones biologically, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, and so I've always just... And then she always has the shaved head look, which is always like a very, uh, very um, a queer vibe overall. Okay. And so, so I've always, I've always had that, you know, resonance with her for me personally. Sure. And then I get to this episode of Something Borrowed, Something Green. And this episode just, uh, it, it meant a lot to me because it, while it doesn't expressly say she's trans, there's a lot in that episode that I think evokes a trans reading of the character because she basically learned at the end of the episode that she was assigned assassin at birth for lack of a better phrase where she was told that she was uh mm-hmm. she was supposed to be an assassin the mistress of the winter constellations but she didn't want to do that she didn't want to ha- take on that role in in her society and chose to go into starfleet yeah and, she didn't want to be a prime exactly right? is that, is that yep. it okay yep i my my jobs i do readings of art like i do analysis of art and when we talk about queer readings of art especially if you mm-hmm. put like a trans or queer reading on, on a work of art characters don't have to be explicitly queer or trans for queer trans people to resonate with them, but the reason that queer trans people resonate with characters is like they are told to be one thing in society and they explicitly choose like, no, I am expressly stating that I am something different and I'm going to pursue myself. I'm going to pursue who I am, not what society tells me to be. Okay. And I think a lot of trans people just resonate with that theme. And so to see Tendi kind of have that exact storyline of being like, I was, I was assigned this at birth. I was told I had to be a prime. I was told I had to be an assassin. But I didn't want that. And I chose Starfleet, something that I chose as a kid, too. Like, I was a weirdo kid, and I chose Star Trek as the way to express and understand myself and 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 understand the, and, and perceive the world. You know, I a lot of my morals, a lot of my values, I'm not a very religious person, but I am a very uh, hopeful person that comes, my values come from Star Trek. Um, and it was what grounded me when I was bullied, when I was figuring out my identity. Like, I may not know if I was a boy or a girl, if I was straight or gay or whatever, but I knew I loved Star Trek. And so to see Tendi have that same path, it really like I I cry. It's a very it's a funny show. It's a comedy show, but I cried during that episode, and I just I absolutely loved that whole sequence. And then if we're gonna talk about the episode as a whole, uh, just to jump off of that emotional bit, the stuff with the twin twains is just silly and dumb and weird, and I love that. Like I love it when Star Trek allows itself to be silly. It can be profound and meaningful and move you to your core, speak to our shared humanity, and then just be dumb and silly and weird. Uh, and and I love that. So like that episode, just like on every fr- and 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 the silly dumb weirdness is in is in support of characters being like kind to each other like they're arguing and they do something silly and dumb and weird that makes them that makes them come to an agreement and 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 love each other more and so it's just like it just it just speaks to why i love lower decks with such a burning passion because it's silly dumb and weird it's so profound it's character driven it speaks to me on a personal level um it explores a new culture like the orions we never get to see like it, it just everything everything that episode is is everything to me even logical to Lynn uh, demonstrates that kindness by tossing her pad uh, exactly. out of the ship as they're flying across the planet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And to Lynn, too, also is someone who has, like, a, she's very, it's not in that episode, really, but in the next episode, she's very neurodivergent coded of, like, being, like, you know, I'm I'm autistic. I'm on the autism spectrum. And so that also resonates with me as well. So, like, again, just, like, the, the, weirdo, the weirdo dorks of Lower Decks I vibe with very hard. Yeah, I think a lot of Star Trek fans look at the Lower Decks people and they think, man, that would be me. Yep, exactly. <laughs> I would be in with those people. Exactly. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know about being accidentally stabbed like three times in a row like Mariner in the episode, <laughs> but, I, you know, that, that would be us. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think every single person, uh, every single Trekkie uh, vibes at least one of the characters of uh, the main five, uh, Talyn included, of Lower Decks, so. I wanted to ask you about one of the episodes that was sort of on the on the bonus list, and, and mm-hmm. then maybe we'll come back to talk about Deep Space Nine in a minute. Yeah. Uh, I, w- I want to ask you about the episode Ad Astra Per Aspera. This, of course, is the court martial episode from mm-hmm. Strange New Worlds. I have a very different take on it. I'm just going to tell you right now than yeah. probably your take, but I'm fascinated to hear what your opinion on it is and why you put it up there as one of the best episodes of Star Trek. I really, really adored Ad Astra Per Aspera because I think it did such a great job. I think it's a necessary episode, especially right now, of getting people to question. You know, I, I, 
you know, on my YouTube channel, I do a lot of discussion about um, trans issues right now because, you know, mm -hmm. trans people are being very vilified, especially in the United States and the United Kingdom, worldwide as well, but especially in those two countries as we've, we've seen a lot of attack of uh, my community um, a lot. And it's been very difficult uh, emotionally, I'll be very frank with you, the last few years. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of the way that trans people are vilified is, is in two ways, uh, one being like the law, the people will make laws against trans people. And say, mm -hmm. you know, you can't have transforming health care or, you know, this and that. And, and it becomes code in the law. And it's like, well, you have to respect that because it's, it's, you know, it's in the law. But the law is, is, is hurtful and harmful and, and, and doing a lot of damage to a very marginalized and, and already attacked group. Um, and then another way is like when trans people speak up, you know, usually we're seen as ridiculous, over the top, uncivil, um, uh, uh, you know, even violent, even if we're just like just speaking up for our rights. And I think what Ad Asper Paraspera does is it does what I think good Star Trek does is it gets people to start to question that because it is an episode about how the law, you know, we take these things as seen as ingrained in the system. Like the system is seen like this is the, this is just the way it is. This makes sense. Right. But it doesn't. But people just because they think that that's the way the world is, they've grown up mm -hmm. in it. They don't question it. And I think Ad Asper Paraspera is kind of poking people in that direction of, of pointing out that the law, the system is not always just, just by nature of it existing. It's, it does not justify its own bigotry, you know? Um, we can see past that. And, and then it also sort of talks about with the character of uh, Una, you know, she's, she mm -hmm. seems to like learn that, you know, she, she should speak up and she should stand up for other people. And I also think that the episode does uh, get... It's like good, I think, dynamics of how you have these conversations within minority communities, you know, because mm -hmm. like within the trans community quite often, too, you know, I'm speaking as a white trans person. So this is a, you know, okay. it's it's, a, you know, a dynamic that we often see is like a lot of white trans voices get elevated over the voices of, you know, black, indigenous and people of color uh, within the trans community as well. You know, and I, I've certainly been a beneficiary of that in the sense that like my voice is certainly being heard and seen more than other, you know, more marginalized voices in my community. And I think what Ad Asper Paraspera does is it, it kind of highlights that conversation that you sometimes have within marginalized communities between like Una who is a, you know, that she's a pa she passes as someone who could work in the Federation. She's literally, they literally say she passes. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, the, the lawyer friend of hers, who's also an Illyrian, does not. And so she, you know, and it's very, I think it's very important that they cast a black woman compared to Una, who is, you know, played by a white actress, to have that conversation about saying like, you know, you could use your privilege here. And I think they say privilege at one point to stand up for people who are more marginalized than you, but you don't. And you should. And because you have the privilege to be seen with more power and respect than other people do. And so I think like on all those levels, Star Trek is using allegory to point out these dynamics that I'm speaking about in the trans community. But I think the episode uh, it talks about it in terms of many different ways. They, they make evocation at one point of uh, like I think the lawyer character says like, you know, they, people are discriminated for their sexuality, for their gender, for their race, for their beliefs. And these dynamics, I think, exist within all of those conversations in many different ways. And so I think the episode really gets it. I have cr criticisms and critiques of the episode. Um, you know, as I, as I do of all Star Trek, I don't think it gets perfectly right, but I think it is, it is certainly getting a lot of the nuances right in a way that I think a lot of Star Trek sometimes doesn't when it comes to the nuances of stuff. So I, I didn't really appreciate that. I was listening to a commentary track, uh, from Battlestar Galactica, the remake and yeah. uh, James, James Callis, the uh, actor who played Gaius Baltar talked about this, this thing that he made up. And I, I think it's a term he actually just made up himself, uh, called mm -hmm. the tragedy of verisimilitude. Mm -hmm. uh, which is when you want to put something which is very authentic into a show, sometimes it's not the thing that the audience expects. Mm -hmm. So then you have to either explain it, which is not like really driving your story forward. And so you yep. just kind of dismiss it. And um, this episode had some of that for me because mm -hmm. the whole idea of the trial uh, I work with a lot of attorneys yeah, and I, yeah. I, I, I know a lot about how this stuff actually works. And the, the, the whole, one of the things that is absolutely true and any attorney I think would back me up on this. I'm very confident in saying My that. dad's a lawyer, so I know also too. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so if you're like a real estate attorney, you do not have them do your merger and acquisition negotiation mm -hmm. for your business. You know, if you are a civil rights attorney, you do not go into a military court and assume that you know all about military court procedure. You are going to get your ass handed to you uh, yeah. just on the procedural grounds. You're going to get crushed. 
Mm-hmm. And that's actually what would have happened, right? And yeah, so yeah. for me, I, I it took me out of the episode for that reason. Yeah. And I love the message. I love all the stuff you're saying. I think it's great, you know, and I, I get that. And and it's just, it, this is one of the things where because of my background and I, I actually yeah. know a little bit about how this stuff works, when I get to that part, I'm like, oh man, no, 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 that's not, oh, that's not how that yeah. works. <laughs> oh, I mean, like there's, there's, I, I agree with you. There's, 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 well, there's, there's some other stuff in some of that episode as well, where it was like, you know, uh, like it makes no sense to that the the one the uh, uh, opposing attorney is like Pike's girlfriend. Like number one, there would be yeah. like a level. There would be like a level of like you should recuse yourself. Number two, she's a captain, so like why is she also acting as lawyer? Like there's a bunch of there's a bunch of stuff. Doesn't and, make and any sense. <laughs> for me, for me, I always chalk that up to it's the future. Star Trek, it's military. It's not military. Who's to ah, say? Gene Roddenberry had different thoughts about it, so I, I always toss it up to that and, and allow it. But uh, but yeah, no, I I yeah my my dad um my dad's a lawyer, and we would watch. He loved the show Boston Legal. Um, oh, yeah. which also had William Shatner and we, we watched that a bunch and I, that show is fun uh, hasn't aged super well I've rewatched some episodes recently like, oh, there's, there's some choices here <laughs> but I loved it as a kid my dad loved it too but he would always be like they always let the the uh, was I think the the um the defense attorney uh gets the like final uh say in the show and he's like they don't get the final they don't get the final uh the final uh speech at the end or whatever it's called so he's like yeah he would go through all that stuff with me so sometimes you chalk it up to just yeah it's the way it, you're making it for the sake of entertainment but i understand people who who hit up on it because there are things that i hit up on it's like that's not correct for other things yeah it's, so. it's when you deeply know a subject and it appears in a piece of popular media you know you're just yep. like mm, no, no. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, in, in my case in the episode it's the it's the vulgar Vulcan lawyer. Oh, um, yeah. I was like, that guy probably knows like military court procedure, Starfleet court procedure, court martial procedures, like inside, outside, upside down. And he'd be running rings around her, mm-hmm. you know, just no procedural stuff. Like she would never get to argue the stuff she wanted to argue because she'd be sitting under, you know, 10,000, you know, pads <laughs> trying to yeah. dig her way out. You know, that's probably how that would go. But yeah. I agree with you. It's a tremendous episode. And I think one that people should watch and take the lessons of seriously. Um, that just one issue in the show just kind of takes me out of it. But that's my struggle. Mm-hmm. Let's move on. Let's talk about Deep Space Nine. Oh, we're getting to some Berman era Trek. Our, our first <laughs> one here. Uh, Change of Heart, Deep Space Nine, Season 6, Episode 16. This, of course, is the one where, for some bizarre reason, uh, Cisco sends a married couple on a on a top secret mission, which like is mind-boggling uh, mm-hmm. that that actually occurs. But we have uh, Worf and Jadzia going on this top secret mission to get the informant off the planet. And, of course, Worf has a decision to make about completing the mission or saving Jadzia. And of course, he goes back and he saves Jadzia. Yeah. So tell me what's going on in this episode for you, Jesse. I, I was trying to think of when you, when we were putting when I was putting together the list for you, I was trying to think of like what's my favorite Deep Space Nine episode. And I don't think that this one necessarily is, but this is an episode I think that allows me to talk about a lot of what I love about Deep Space Nine. And I do like this sure. episode quite a lot too. That's okay. But um, first and foremost, just to talk about Deep Space Nine since we haven't had a chance for it, uh, and it is my my favorite my favorite Star Trek show. I think period again vying for lower decks on any day of the week, but uh, but what I love about DC Nine is actually you you were saying it's like it's very different from lower decks and it is to a degree, but I actually think that they have a lot of similarities in 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 terms of what I vibe with in the sense okay, that okay yeah say more about that yeah I'm interested yeah. Lower Decks is the show where it's expressed in the title. It's about the Lower Decks, the people on the ship that like people don't get respected. People don't see uh, as much. They don't. They're the working class, you know, sort of a Starfleet uh, to put in those terms. And Deep Space Nine is that too. Deep Space Nine is, you know, it's not the Captain Picards on the flagship of the ship. It's it's the people who like Cisco, who's like was considering leaving Starfleet, was was not considered the best of the best, and yet, uh, you know, and yet he takes over this station and does just as well. And every single one of these characters on Deep Space Nine, whether they be Starfleet or not, are the weirdos. Like, they are the weirdos of Starfleet. They are the strange ones. They are the Jadzia Dax. Dax. You're like, your uh, your slug lady warrior woman. You have your 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 capitalist goblins. You have your gender fluid cops with Odo. You know, you have your, uh, like, it, it, everyone is just, is just a, a strange, uh, like, strange character. But they, they still I would find... say Jadzi is a superstar Starfleet she officer, is. though. And I, w- I, I, would I would say she, she's top shelf. Well, I'll get to, I'll get to her in a minute. Believe okay. me, trust me, trust me. But yeah, she is she is top shelf uh, officer if you want to if you want to go. But in terms of like her being her identity is very strange in terms of a lot of uh, a lot of ways. But it is a sh- place where you know it's off to the side. It's mm-hmm. Deep Space Nine. No one was supposed to think about it until the wormhole came along. You have Kira, who was a terrorist. You know, she was a terrorist freedom fighter. 
you know, mm-hmm. so many, so many they, people all fighting fascism you know, of the Cardassians, um, you know, and so it's about these people who are not seen by the systems that they grew up in, uh, or lived within as like the best of the best or, or, or the, um, the people that would be seen to be like the Picards being on the flagship. And yet they form a found family together. It may be a bit, maybe not work as easily as, you know, the crew of the Enterprise D, but it does work. They find they find things that they care about with each other. They respect each other. They learn to respect each other. They come to, uh, you know, fight one of the biggest battles in all of Star Trek and win. And they sometimes have to make questionable system or uh, questionable choices, but they do it, and they do it all in the hopes of making a better world. And I think that that kind of vibes with me in the same way that Lower Decks vibes with me that these they are the weird characters, and yet they are able to find love and value and caring by believing the ideals that Star Trek, Starfleet, uh, all of these things stand for. And so that's why I really love Deep Space Nine. You know, I, I talk about you know I was talking earlier about like doing queer readings of art. Mm-hmm. And while Deep Space Nine, Deep Space Nine, I think has the most kind of queer adjacent or very queer obvious characters in in all of Star Trek uh, in terms of an explicit sense, but in terms of its ethos, its ethos is very queer. It's a it's a queer ethos in the sense that they are people who are cast off and sometimes are not seen as the best of the best, and yet they thrive anyways, and they form their own spaces, they form their own um, they form their own places that outside of the the higher echelons uh of starfleet so I, I think on that level it's just why i really love deep space nine so much and also too uh terms of like you being queer too like things like you know the way the show talks about time mm-hmm. you know there's a thing in the queer community about the like, queer temporality about how queer people view time differently you know we you know trans people we consider being born again like when we when we transition we talk about being we talk about like traumas that many trans people deal with and you go to like cisco and he says you know i exist the very first episode i exist here his trauma with his wife and having to move beyond traumas and a lot of queer people also exist with a lot of trauma from their from their upbringing and things that happen to them and that sometimes pulls them back through their trauma through time um so there's just a lot of like a lot of queer people there's a there's a whole field of research called queer temporality that like deep space nine fits right within in terms of relationship to time but then this brings me to the episode that we we're talking about and the reason I picked it mm-hmm. is Jadzia, who is a character I've talked about elsewhere, is my favorite character in Star Trek. Okay. Because of the very clear resonances with the trans experience. She is, she is, you know, she was seen as a guy, you know, in her previous lives through the Trill symbiote. But the, people like Cisco see her and they respect her past. You know, he calls her old man, you know, which some people have, when you relate to a trans experience, people say, oh, is that to him dead naming her if you're doing a queer reading? It's like, no, it's him saying, I'm a friend. I see the totality of who you are and I know your experience and I, and I love you fully for that. And so that calling of old man is a, is a respect for his, his Mm -hmm. fullness of understanding who she is. See with the Klingons, the Klingons just like, they say, Oh, I go by Jetsia now. And it's like, Oh, we won't use Curzon. We'll go by Jetsia. So the Klingons aren't, aren't dead naming her that way. So it's like, and, and, and just a character that just uh, like was all of those things. And then on top of that, she just has a confidence. You were talking about earlier, like she is like top shelf stuff, the officer. And I love that about her because, you know, when when trans people, especially younger trans people come out, they're kind of like Esri. And I adore Esri for this. We call them baby transes. It's kind of in the trans community. They're raking the trans egg. Mm-hmm. But it's just uh, just like learning, learning how to be confident in their new identity of like, you wanted this your whole life. You wanted to be this thing your whole life. And yet you're like, I'm unsure of how pronouns work now. I'm trying to figure out. It's kind of joyful. And yet, kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing at the moment, as you're figuring it out. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a second puberty. But Jadzia just has such a sense of self, um, especially as they like found her character more in the later seasons of being like the sort of like, uh, like, like more roguish type of character. And then I get to this episode specifically. And a lot of people have criticisms of Worf and Jadzia's relationship. I actually really love Worf and Jadzia's relationship quite a lot. Because I do think that they bounce off of each other really well. Jets, they they have like an aggressive love for each other, uh, very obviously. Um, and and I think that that is just it's it's so really nice to see, especially like they learn like Worf has his own hangups. He's definitely got a lot of stuff going oh, yeah. on. Oh yeah, and yet he he works through them with Jetsia. Like Jetsia says, you know, I have a problem with this. Like, and he's like, okay, I will do better. And something I've been thinking more and more about as I get older Mm -hmm. is how much like relationships and love and and both romantic and platonic mean a lot to me Mm -hmm. in, in my life. And with trans people, 
we don't often, you know, because we are so vilified often, it's sometimes harder for us to find connections uh, in terms of like finding people who will support us, find people who will love us romantically, platonically. And when we do, we, they mean the world to us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, criticism of the episode aside is why you would ever send a married couple on a military mission. Bad choice. Uh, that, that's on <laughs> Cisco. That's on Cisco. Um, but to see an episode where like Worf chooses like this person that he loves person who is trans coded for a lot of trans people and chooses her and chooses to protect her, which often trans people are often considered like, well, you know, like there are my, like one of the big things we see with trans people is like, they're a minority. Why do we have to care about them? You know, why do we have to care about 1% of the population is the thing I often see come up mm -hmm. and I see someone say, it's like, no, I'm going to choose to care about her and make sure to prioritize her. It's nice. It's really, it was really meaningful to see and to see that love on display. And yes, there, I, I think it also raises like larger ethical questions uh, as Deep Space Nine does of like, you know, individual versus like with a larger like things going on with the Dominion War. Um, some really great moments where like Cisco at the end saying to Worf, like, you'll never be a captain, but I understand why you made the choice that you did. Like, like those like conflicts that come up. Um, I think speak to what Deep Space Nine does well. So yeah, so if I if I was being honest, like change of heart, I don't know if it's my favorite Deep Space Nine episode, but I think it's an episode that allows me a really good way to like channel a lot of the things that I love about Deep Space Nine into talking about an episode. So oh, I think that's perfectly okay to pick. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. You're talking about Worf growing as a character and, and I don't think he's all the way there yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think we got a very different Worf, let's say in the most recent season of Picard, but the mm -hmm. Worf that we're looking at in this particular episode, if let, let me, let me give you a, a, a scenario and see how you respond to it. Yeah. If, if for some reason, and this would not have happened, but if for some reason, uh, Keiko and miles would have gone on the mission <laughs> and come back <laughs> How do you, how do you think Worf would have responded to Miles after the mission? You know, I oh, I think his response yeah. might have been something along the lines of "You have dishonored yourself by not uh, successfully completing the mission." <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's what like that's what's really great about Worf, though, right? Like he is mm -hmm. a he is a really complicated figure in the sense that he he gets things wrong a lot of the time or he's dealing mm -hmm. with stuff like i think he's one of the few characters like next generation um especially when he started off like next generation the characters remain static a lot of times like there are arcs to the character like Riker grows a little bit picard grows a little bit um they all grow but their their arcs are much like slower builds and they take a little bit more right. time whereas yep. Worf, i feel like he kind of he's always growing he i think he has some of the biggest arcs all the way through next generation he learns how to be a better father he learns to get over with his like kind of weird uh, like hangups about sex and 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 possessing yeah. women with um with uh with um I forget Alexander's mama's uh name Kalar um, Kalar yeah and so like he has this big arc about and like dealing with the Klingons and his relationship to their society and and Deep Space Nine he does the same thing too he has an even greater arc in coming to learn like this society that he's venerated his whole life the Klingons that has constantly like devalued him for numerous reasons. He needs to learn that it needs to change the end, uh, and he helps lead to that change. So, like, he has this such great arc, and so I think that that's like, you know, Worf is one of my favorite characters, but I think he's one of the most complicated characters in in Star Trek. And a lot of people give Worf, <laughs> understandably so, but I think like the <laughs> that like he gets is deserved. But I think mm -hmm. he gets it in the series itself, and he's constantly working through it in uh, in I think a really kind of interesting way. And with Jed Sias particularly, I think. She comes to understand that. And there's so many, like, um, just many episodes where, like, Jesse and even Esri later on, too, um, will just call him on it. And he yeah. he takes that to heart and he listens to it. Yeah, I, I love Esri. Uh, my favorite Dax, by the way. So mm -hmm. I, I get oh, a lot Esri's of grief in that. I know it's not a popular opinion, but it is mine. <laughs> oh, no, I, lo I love Esri as well. Like, I, I honestly, I feel like if she had gotten more time... Mm -hmm. And I, I adore her to death. I did a whole video on her for my for my channel. Uh, I, I honestly, if I if I had had more time with her, if we got to see her for like a two or three more seasons. Um, I think she would be right up there with 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 Jez. He is one of my favorites. So I, I don't know where I want to go with this, but you spurred a thought in your in your discussion there about Worf. And, yeah. and maybe it's worth spending a moment on, yeah. which is that he's growing as a character. He sort of learns his own way by the time we get to the Picard show he's kind of mm -hmm. doing his own thing now but when we're thinking of him more in the Berman movie era it seems to me that that Worf is a character that is becoming a Klingon that he imagines 
Mm -hmm. them to be rather not as they are. When we see the Klingons, they're either more like gambler carouser types or they're like the mm -hmm. Duras. You know, yeah. a little bit of Kempek, you know, sort of a scheming politician type. But when mm -hmm. it comes to like the, you know, we're, you know, all honor and glory and all that, that like that's the exception. Like we yeah. don't, we actually don't see most of them like that. And so, I don't know, I'm wondering what, what, what we are to make of this Worf character that has these aspirations to, to be someone that doesn't actually exist. It, it's an inchoate thought. I, I don't have it fully formed. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I think it's a great thought. And actually, uh, what I would encourage you, uh, if you're thinking about because th this isn't one that I can really discuss, but I, I can talk about it from a sort of distanced way, in mm -hmm. the sense that like there is an element of like, you know, an immigrant sort of discussion about like many, many second generation immigrants. Uh, I've talked to with friends I know had similar experiences where they'll sort of like have a veneration of the culture that their parents came from that they didn't really get to know, mm -hmm. but then will not will um will like it'll be different than than they actually imagine because they only see the ideal version, which can be somewhat of a you know it can you can sort of erase a lot of the intricacies and nuances uh, of the experience, but also like they can hold on to maybe some of the values of the culture as well. Um, and then I've also seen again this is something that's I would just direct you I know um. Two two people that I've I've talked to with Star Trek about um you know a YouTuber a friend of mine FD Signifier um and then also I know uh, Kennedy um who has been on Women at Warp as well she's talked about Warp as well in terms of like a black experience about how many you know black uh, folks will in America specifically um in the in sort of African diaspora will sort of like um, venerate African culture while also sort of like not really seeing the tollness of that culture as well and some of the negative aspects or things that are more complicated. Again, not my place to talk about that, but I know that like uh, people have had that discussion. I think, uh, especially since Worf, Michael Dorn is a black man, I think there's some interesting uh, rhymes there. So, Speaking from my own experience, there is a thing where, um, so we're, we're Armenian, my wife and I, and we're, I'm third generation. My wife was born here. Her parents were fresh off boat. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that is very traditional is to go visit the homeland, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had a friend who recently did one of these. Uh, this was before all the stuff happening in Ukraine. Yeah. And he came back and he had a very different experience, which was like, if you thought that, you know, you're going to come back here and you're like, we're brothers, like we are mm -hmm. not the same. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Those yeah. of us who are living here, we are not the same. Yeah. <laughs> and if you are America high or, or you know, some other kind of... Uh, a uh, person from some other place, you know, you're you're virtually the same as the other Americans. Don't don't come back here thinking you know anything about what it's like to live here. Uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. it's a very it was a very shocking experience. Uh, it was a very shocking experience to say the least. So yeah. uh, perhaps someday I will take my my kid over there and we will have a a visit uh, with proper humility uh, and we'll see how it goes. But yeah. that is a chapter that is yet to be written. So Jesse, we've talked a little bit about how much time you spend as a content creator. You have a lifetime of watching Star Trek. You're putting a lot of hours into making Star Trek related content in addition to many other things. You're spending a couple hours talking with me, some rando that you met at the Star Trek convention uh, just uh, not too long ago uh, about Star Trek. Obviously, it's a big part of your life. My question is, why do you care about Star Trek? What does it mean to you? I mean, I think we we touched upon it uh, like in spits and spurts about this, but for me, I think coming across Star Trek as young as I did, especially with all the things that I was dealing with as a kid, being being trans, also being my parents were divorced and having to go between different houses all the time and um, figuring myself out, being bullied a bunch as well. Like Star Trek was this thing that gave me a, a grounding and, and felt like a sense of identity, especially when I was figuring out the rest of myself mm -hmm. and, and also allowed a way through that in terms of like characters like Jadzia and, and helping to give give words to that. And then from there, I think a lot of what Star Trek values, kind of what we're talking about, is love of love of the other, the love of difference, the love of uh, the love of kindness, the love of exploring, the love of, of learning. Those are all things that I have come to take as core to who I am and what I try to put forth every day. Um, and uh, and I think that, that that's what Star Trek, I think, means to me is just this love of exploration, of learning, of love, of kindness, of diversity and difference. Um, and I, I wouldn't have it any other way. So like, I think for me, in so many ways, Star Trek is a grounding factor for me. Um, in terms of my identity and my beliefs and my hope for the future of humanity and all the work that I do. So I think that that's, that's, that's core to it. 
Well, Jesse, I've enjoyed our conversation. I hope you have as well. Yeah, I've loved this has been great. I, I always enjoy talking way too long about Star Trek. I love it so much. Uh, I know you could tell by my episode uh, duration that uh, I also love talking about Star Trek. Yeah. The M5 is signaling me that it is now time for the Kobayashi Maru. I'm excited. The Kobayashi Maru lightning round is a challenging and difficult test, cunningly prepared by the M5 just for you. Oof. Should you not only survive the test, but pass it as well, the M5 will award you an honorary Star Trek title on behalf of our little program. Are you ready, Jesse, to face the M5? I am ready. M5, load the Kobayashi Maru simulation and prepare to record our guest responses. M5 working. Simulation loaded and ready. Which engage do you prefer, Captain Pike or Captain Picard? Pike. Worst Star Trek talent show. The EMH singing opera, poetry reading by data, stand-up comedy by data, or TOS Riley singing old folk songs? Oh, uh, TOS Riley singing old folk songs. Pick something to do tonight. TV with Tom and Balana, bowling on Kirk's Enterprise, movie night on the NX-01, or spandex aerobics with Yana and Beverly. <laughs> um, movie night on the NX-01. Which has the best Chekhov scream? The Deadly Years, The Motion Picture, The Wrath of Khan, or The Way to Eat? Ooh. The Motion Picture, I think. Love me a good Chekhov scream. Mm -hmm. uh, who are we having a space beer with? AQ, note that's not the Q, but it's AQ, could be anyone. A Caretaker, an Organian, or a Wormhole Prophet? Oh. I feel like it would have to be AQ. I feel like it would have to be a Q. Simulation complete. M5, please compute the results and tell us if our guest has passed the Kobayashi Maru. Jesse, I am pleased to tell you that the M5 has calculated that you have passed the Kobayashi Maru simulation. Yeah. Congratulations. Hell yeah, I knew I'd pass it. I'm confident. I'm like Chris Pine Kirk. I got this. There you go. You want an apple? <laughs> <laughs> I do. It would be great. And now, the M5, who has analyzed your answers, will award you an honorary Star Trek title on behalf of our podcast. M5, what title shall we award our guest? Jesse is awarded the title of Editorial Manager for the Federation News Service. I like that. So, Jesse, why don't you tell people how they can get in touch with you, uh, where they can take you to task for your Star Trek opinions, uh, where they can <laughs> debate with you on the relative merits of which Dax is best, and uh, where they can find out about this movie that you're making. Yeah, uh, so yeah, just to do the spiel, uh, you can find me um, most e easiest at Jesse Gender on YouTube. So if you just type in Jesse Gender, you'll find my YouTube channel. Uh, that's where I do video essay type of stuff, like we've been talking about. I try and, you know, I do a lot of Star Trek related stuff specifically, but I also talk about politics and, and um, all of these issues, and usually through a sci-fi or nerdy lens. Um, so if any of that sounds interesting to you about talking about some of the deeper meanings behind science fiction, your favorite movies and TV shows, that's where you'll find me there. Um, I have a secondary channel called Jesse Gender After Dark, where I do more sort of like review content. So if you want my reviews of Lower Decks and, and Picard and Discovery and all of that stuff, that'll be there for you. So I'll have some other shows. Then I have a podcast that I mentioned earlier called the Jumpgate Podcast, uh, which is a Babylon 5 rewatch podcast. It's currently on a uh, hiatus just while the SAG strikes going on. So it's now called the We Are All Pawns Podcast about the TV show The Prisoner. But once that wraps up, and hopefully the SAG uh, strike wraps up as well, um, we'll be back to Babylon 5, and it'll be on the same feed. And then in terms of the movie, uh, the aforementioned movie, it is called Identities, uh, I-D-E-N-T-I-T-E-A-Z-E. -E -E. uh, and it is a cyberpunk uh, queer film that I like to pitch as The Matrix meets Severance. Um, so if those two things sort of sound interesting to you, I think you'll definitely love this. Um, and it's a movie that stars John Delancey, who plays uh, Q uh, in Star Trek, uh, Jessica Nicole from Fringe, Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube, if you're a big YouTube nerd, and a bunch of other queer uh, and trans folks as well. Um, and that is going to be on the streaming service Nebula which is a streaming service that supports me and a bunch of other YouTube creators. And it's a um, uh, it's creator owned platform um, that uh, that, you know, is, is there to help people who like myself who uh, 
you know, the YouTube algorithm may not be kind to, but we can sort of create a space that supports a lot of really diverse and wonderful creators there. Um, and they support wonderful content like Identity. So uh, if you go subscribe to uh, Nebula, you'll be helping Identities. You'll be able to get the film when it comes out early next year. And you'll be helping a bunch of other creators like myself. So I would I would highly recommend that. So that's pretty much all of the other stuff. And then I'm on the social medias, you know, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter and Instagram, TikTok, you know, all Blue Sky, all that stuff. So. And we will put links up to all of that up on the show notes page up at truckprofiles.com. So you can go right there and find links to all of Jesse's amazing and wonderful content that I would urge all of you to subscribe to and to support. Jesse, thank you so much for being part of Truck Profiles. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was an absolute joy. I, I really love this. And I lo- thank you for letting me talk about the uh, the weird aspects of my Star Trek fandom because a lot of time I talk about like, you know, you know these normal episodes that, you know, the nerds like. But you know, I, I'm here to talk about Spock versus Q, so I appreciate it. Here ends this installment of the Trek Profiles podcast. And before we offer a Trek quote to close this episode, I'd like to remind you, yes, you, that you may send us a kind communique, a dastardly and damning dispatch, or your recipes for a nice plummy soup to feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter or Blue Sky at Trek Profiles. Anything you send us, maybe using the show or maybe packaged up and regifted to someone at an Orion wedding. This time, I'll leave you with a quote from Mariner, who in the episode Something Borrowed Something Green said, quote, Look, I'm from a post-scarcity world, and this is still impressive. Look at that big-ass gate. Close quote. Thanks for listening, and live long and prosper. This handcrafted podcast is brought to you by Stars and Sky Media Lab. It's cosmic. So, first of all, so awesome to see you again. Uh, We only talked for like five seconds at the convention, but uh, I hope it was everything you had uh, wanted at the the con (laughs) and you got home I mean, it most definitely is. Like it, it, it was my second ever. It was my first Star Trek Las Vegas or STLV, I guess, as they have to call it now legally. Um, first ever one of those, but my second ever Star Trek specific convention because mm-hmm. I went to Mission Chicago, um, and it was wonderful. Like I, I, it, it was just, it was great to be around just straight Trekkies. Uh, well, I shouldn't say straight Trekkies, just Trekkies. <laughs> <laughs> it was great to be around just like pure Trekkies for for uh, a significant amount of time because, you know, I've been doing nerd stuff for a very long time and I've been a Trekkie for pretty much most of my life. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I haven't had a chance to just do Star Trek specific cons outside of the last few years. And so that has been really joyous because typically at cons you have to like kind of look for the star trek stuff yeah it's gotten more and more over the past few years but typically if you go even go to like the bigger cons it's like oh one person will wear a starfleet uniform or there'll be like one artist who has like a picture of star trek stuff over here you know so it's nice to be at a just pure star trek fantastic event. well we will talk about all that during the show so that sounds wonderful i'm excited uh any questions for me no, that all sounds great. I am really excited. This sounds like a this sounds like a lot of fun. Honestly, this is one of the most put together podcasts I've been on. I've 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 never gotten a spiel that thorough. I love it. Oh, I told you I'm high structure. Uh, you know, so that I love it. No, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. So you know, I tweet those out as polls, mm-hmm. and and there's one poll from a previous episode right now that's going on, and I. I, it, it would, the, the question that's that's being polled right now is a virus is deleting all hollow programs in existence. We only have time to save one. Which ones are going to be? Mm-hmm. And the choices are like the adventures of Flotter, Fair Haven, uh, Dixon Hill or Vulcan Love Slave. And I remembered what I asked the question. I was like, Vulcan Love Slave is going to win because Star Trek <gasps> fans be horny. Like it is mm-hmm. definitely going to win. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we'll see. It's, it's like neck and neck. So we'll see. We'll see. How What's it goes. the other one that's winning? Dixon, Dixon Hill? Dixon Hill and Fairhaven and Vulcan Love Slave are all within like it's like a three way tie almost. Oh, interesting. Flotter interesting. has got like two percent. Nobody's picking that. Uh, oh so, come on, I love Flotter. Uh, well, how can you not? Right? It's someone yeah. it was funny. Someone tweeted a gif at me like, "Will you please think of the children? People who vote for Flotter." <laughs> <laughs> love that. Uh, uh.
I the only one I want to just mention because we just talked about is we had the question of like what's the worst talent show and I picked Riley. I only picked the reason I picked Riley because he was like singing about like oh women's suffrage and like all this. I'm like oh I, I'm not sure I really want to hear Riley's Riley's folk songs when he's just complaining about women's suffrage. <laughs> 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 well, he does that one i'll take you home again kathleen is that yeah, what that, is that the yeah, one you're talking exactly. about exactly yeah oh, the, I, no, this, I, in the in the naked time he's just like he's uh drunk uh on the, the deadly virus or whatever and he's just yeah. like oh look at the women on the bridge i always tell you women deserve their place and it, was, it was a very clear like thing written in the 1960s uh right, about, like right, look right. it's women but it's like this the the year 20 you know 20 30 whatever you know he still ranted about women's suffrage <laughs> Right on. I get it. You know, it's all a function of its time in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's I, I always think like when people look back at the Star Trek that we're consuming now, the stuff they're making today, I wonder what they're going to say about it in 50 years. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I don't oh, know. Sure. How could they have done that? You know, barbarians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be some of that. God knows what it'll be about, but uh, there'll be some there'll be something. Oh, I'm sure. Most certainly. That is absolutely the, the right thing. I mean, that <laughs> this show, my show is a celebration of each interviewee's fandom, right? And if yeah. that's the part of Trek that speaks to you, that is the part of Trek that speaks to you. And there's no right or wrong answers regarding exactly. any of that. But I let me agree. just ask, was was everything okay for you in the recording? I always like to make oh. sure my guests have a good experience. Oh, well, I had a great experience. This was absolutely wonderful. I love this. So that, yeah, I know this was fun. Okay, fantastic. And, I, and now I got to ask you, because you brought it up and I, I know you got people waiting for you, but I, I got to ask you, Severance? Yeah. Oh, I love Severance. That show oh my was God. so good. Yeah, probably one of the best things I think I have seen in the last few years. Yeah, and no, it, I tell people about it, they're like, "That doesn't sound good." I'm like, "No, it's amazing." <laughs> it is. Oh my god! Every time I watch it, I'm just I've watched it a couple times now, and it's just it, it's so inspiring. Like it's so clever and thoughtful, and yet makes you like you're intrigued by the mystery, and yet you're like also energized to go and like, yeah, I want to try and change the world a little bit and screw this corporate culture bullshit. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's oh, it's so good. Have Have you heard of the Severed podcast? No, I have not. I would I would strongly encourage you to go download the podcast called Severed. I have no connection okay. to it. I just the, the guy who puts it on, uh, Alan S. and and it's great. He's he's like adopted the whole Severance thing. He's like, hello, macro data refiners, you know, reporting for duty. Right mm -hmm. today's today's task, today's file is you know episode whatever, and um, mm -hmm. he gives such a careful watch of every episode, and I'm talking in excruciating detail. Yeah. Um, he notices things in the episode that I, I mean, I, I watched the episodes. I'd listen to his episode, his podcast. Then I had to go back and watch the episode again to see like all the stuff that he does. And he, he talks about the locations where stuff was filmed. He's connected to the sister of the writer. And so she's sending him stuff, you know, oh, I and love that. it's, I cannot recommend it highly enough, um, but you're going to want to go back and watch all the episodes again. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, so. I've done it a few times. I'm happy to do that because, yeah, no, my the film that I'm doing is very inspired by Severance. Uh, I don't want to spoil it in case you get a chance to watch it. But, no, uh, no, I, I, please don't. Uh, but, please don't. But yeah, no spoilers. Yeah, yeah, I won't spoil my own thing for you, but um, but it is very inspired by Matrix Matrix and Severance. So it's, it's so kind of a, yeah, I, I want you to weigh in on this controversy. Yeah. Is uh, Gemma uh, deceased at the end of season one? Gemma. Which one's Gemma again? I'm trying to remember. His wife. Oh. oh yeah, no, no, no. Isn't she? She's the uh, the HR lady, right? Oh, you right. think well, they they do take her away at the end? No, I don't. The think counselor. She's yeah, yeah. You, you I don't, don't think, think she's she, dead. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think that'd be that'd be, be they cut themselves off from some interesting drama if they don't if they don't uh, keep her around. I would think because That's there's all this weirdness. Like it apparently it looks like there's people who were full time severed. Like they never have. Mm -hmm. an Audi experience anymore and and she's one of those and so yeah. I'm kind of like I don't know what's going oh, on oh in I, terms of like her being like because I think if she's still like the, the physical body still alive but he, oh do you think she like her own mind is like gone yeah that would is be there an too. Audi Gemma oh yeah I hadn't even really thought about that because I was just sort of like waiting to see what the show did but uh that would be interesting that that I don't know actually I, I mean, feel like that'll probably be the question of the series my assumption would be going forward honestly about like can she be saved um like and can can like is her audi exist and and i guess even the question being like does does her audi deserve deserve maybe the wrong word but like does her audi um does does her any deserve to be just as much a full-time alive person as her audi it's an interesting question whenever i tell people about the show 
And yeah. I just described the premise, like, you know, you get the, you know, there's the inside outside, you have the, the chip in your head and you go to work and, you know, everything disappears. And now, you, you know, so many, I don't know if you've had this experience, but people tell me, they're like, oh yeah, I would definitely want that. Like I would sign up for that today. Like, uh-huh. I don't want, and I'm like, it's, but that's what this show is. And you realize this is not what you think it is. Like, forget all yeah. the Lumen stuff. Right. Yeah. But the whole, the whole idea that like, you don't know, I mean, I'm thinking of Dylan, right. You know, mm-hmm. do I have a, do I have a, do I have a spouse? Do I have a kid? Do, like, do I, do I like sports? Like, well, you, even you, like, even, even like the other thing where like your things happen to your body and you don't know. Like that feels so weirdly violating. Like if they, I think they like, um, there's that one episode where like he hurts himself and he comes home and he has like a note it was like, oh, you got hurt while you were at work. It's like, I, it just feels weird to like, yeah. just, just imagine like something's happening to your body. You have no idea what it is, you know? Uh, now have you read the Lexington letter? No, I have not. So, um, Apple as part of their thing with the show, mm-hmm. they put out a free iBook that you can download. It's part of the show. So this is not like a fan thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Lexington letter is really two parts. The first part of it is something that you saw in the show. It's the MDR handbook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can actually download and read the full MDR handbook. Oh, the wow. second I'm part. That. Yeah, and you saw a little bit of it in the show, but you can download the full handbook. The second part is an expose from a former severed employee who was able to figure out how to defeat some of the uh, the, the the letter sensors in the elevators. Yeah. And she was able to pass herself notes. Oh, and wow. it's about her. It's like her expose that she sends out and it's that expose. And so it's, yeah, it's, the, it's, the, it's those two things. Um, I'll have to check this out. Yeah. You got to check it out. Cause it's part of the show. It's part of what Apple put out and it's all legit stuff, but you know, you don't have to have read it to enjoy the show, but it gives you some, some good, some good background. And there's some interesting clues in there about certain things all right i will tell you so, yeah because i just downloaded it i'll have to take a look at this yeah i won't i won't spoil it but there's something about the newspaper and 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 all that so just just pay attention to that stuff and, and see if that rings any bells for you all right i will check this out this sounds this looks wonderful all right oh it's very good and you can do it in 15 minutes is all it'll take you to read yeah it, no so. i'm already i've already scrolling through it as we're talking right now i have it downloaded now so i will check it out 